Good evening. Welcome to the continuation of the Tuesday, April 22nd Elmhurst Board of Education meeting. The uh, board has been in closed session since 6 p.m. discussing uh, student discipline and employment of employee. Um, we have seven board members present, uh, none absent. Um, so if you'd please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next on the agenda is public comments. I don't have any blue cards up here. Is there anybody in the audience that came to s address the board this evening? Hearing none, um, then we'll move on to superintendent's communication. Mr. Perneau. Uh, before I get into the formal communication on the agenda, I would just like your indulgence. I have some good news. Um, news flashes that I would like to give to the board this evening. Uh, first of all, our first one is that for the fifth year in a row, our financial department has received the Certificate of Excellence in Financial Reporting. Uh, and this is for its comprehensive annual financial report. And it is um, meeting all of the general accounting principles that are critical to a school district. And this honor is sponsored by VALIC, and it's a certificate of excellent award that confirms the district's commitment to financial accountability and transparency. Um, and it really is a critical factor in strengthening the district's presentation for bond issue statements and promotes a high level of financial reporting. So I'd like to uh, say congratulations to Chris Welton and his staff, again, fifth year in a row to do this, which is an outstanding achievement. So Chris, congratulations. Then, uh, and we, you have met these students before, but um, they have uh, our semifinalists for national merit. All seven have now been named as national merit finalists. So they are batting 100%, and I believe this is the second year in a row we're batting 100%, that all of our semifinalists have been moved to finalists. And so uh, they will be considered for national merit scholars to be offered next year. The selection of some 8,000 merit scholarship winners from the group of more than 15,000 finalists is now in progress. So we would like to congratulate all of those students. They were Matthew Bidman, Gloria Frank, Joe Kesserling, Andrew Marotti, Matthew Nawara, Eric Peterson, and Paula Salamanca. So congratulations to all of those students. And uh, we have uh, two seniors, Samantha Harrell, Sounds familiar. And Matthew Nawari have been named National Merit Motorola Solution Scholarship winners. Samantha's probable career field is civil engineering, while Matt is agricultural and engineering. Uh, the Motorola Solutions Foundation is supported by the Motorola Corporation and has provided to high school seniors who were sons and daughters of Motorola Solution employees and to other outstanding students from the metropolitan Chicago area. So congratulations to those. And and last but not least, for York overall, the Washington Post uh, has an annual calculation of America's most challenging high schools. And York Community High School has placed 22nd in the state, and that is up from 31 ranking last year. And 832 in the country, uh, up from 1,999 the previous year. And to earn a spot on the list, and there are only 2,000 public high school or schools that make this list in the country. To earn a spot, the post divides the number of advanced placement, international baccalaureate and advanced international certificate of education tests given at the school each year by the number of seniors who graduated that year. And anybody who has a 1.0 or higher on the list uh, on that is put on the recognition list. So out of 2,000 high schools across the country, we're in the top half and 22nd in the state. So congratulations to Diana in York for continuing to move up on a lot of recognition across the country on evaluations of high schools. So congratulations. <laughs> uh, and with that, let me get to my, 
Uh, tech, now I'm going to skip the agenda for one so I can look up uh, freedom of information. Tech funding, I'm going to turn this over to David and you can talk about tech funding. Yeah, I'll come back to the floor. Good evening. Um, this uh, presentation is the one I've been up here a few times <laughs> about every year about this time. This is an update to a, a presentation you've probably seen before. Um, I'm going to move through it relatively quickly, at least the parts that you've seen before, and then maybe focus in on a few new areas. And then, of course, if you have questions at the end. And I've worked with Kathy Baker on putting parts of this together, so Kathy's also here this evening if uh, we have questions that may pertain to her. So uh, again, this is a summary you've seen before. It shows a historical trend of um, expenditures and projected budget, uh, projected expenditures. Uh, you can see that uh, this year where the, where the uh, vertical line is, we're at about uh, 2.36 million. I um, guess I need new glasses. I'm having a hard time seeing the far view graph. And uh, projected to go up slightly next year and then um, again slightly the following year. Uh, what's behind those slight increases is a building um, where, you know, we've been, out, we've been building out our infrastructure, we've been leasing that equipment. It's been quite a heavy lease load the last few years, and those payments are building up. But what will also happen as we finish the infrastructure upgrades is uh, those payments will begin to get paid off, and, and you'll find, we'll find ourselves settling back down again. Because the major expenditures with those uh, core network upgrades will carry us for many years, and we, we shouldn't have to be doing this on an annual basis uh, after this coming school year. So we should be largely finished with that and uh, be focusing more on classroom technology and other software or other technologies that we need to purchase without focusing so much on the, on the, on the heavy duty infrastructure. Um, just some trends, again, an update from last year showing a growing, uh, again, growing number of systems that we support in, in the technology department. Um, every year it's gone up. And uh, again, this year even we're adding a couple more. So next year, if, if we see this very same presentation, you'll probably see a higher, a higher graph next year on the top chart there. And then the two bottom charts are again just showing a trend in adding computers that are in service in the district, as well as other technologies in the classroom, such as interactive whiteboards or, other, or smart boards, as we call them, and iPads and iPods. And, and these numbers are as of December of 2013, so um, they creep up slowly throughout the school year, and next year, you know, you can expect to see those numbers up a little bit higher from that. Uh, in terms of people trends, um, I apologize for the colorful you know, the charts that are hard to read at the bottom, but um, those are new, and I'll talk about those in a second. But then along the top, again, just showing um, t compensation relatively flat just because of staffing changes, um, insourcing. Uh, the staff many years ago and um, now of course it's growing and it will continue to grow with uh, with annual increases and then on the upper right uh, chart showing this is a new new graph to show basically in terms of the end user tech support staff in the district we've been relatively flat for since um, fiscal year 2008 that's the red bar at the top relatively flat FTE um, and then you can see the turnover rate on that team has been fairly high recently and so the net effect that we've been having, I believe, I feel is contributing to the customer satisfaction rating that we've had. I'm not saying that's the only factor, but I think it is a contributing factor to the, our struggle in um, maintaining a, the higher levels of customer satisfaction that we've, that we've been able to, to experience in the past. So you'll see that in a minute. Um, the graphs at the bottom are meant to depict uh, how Elmhurst compares against um, other districts in the area. The center graph, the centermost graph, compares us against 21 DuPage and King County districts that responded to a survey and basically shows us the orange color kind of indicates that we're a little hot or a little above average in a, in a negative way in the sense of um, being um, supporting more, uh, u more employees and more devices with fewer technical support staff compared to the 21 area districts that responded to the survey. And the bottom table shows how we compare against our benchmark districts, but unfortunately not all of the benchmark districts responded to the survey. But of the uh, four other districts that responded, you can see that Geneva 304 is actually doing very well. They're basically leading the pack. And Wheaton 200 um, seems to have staffing and support at well below average compared to the um, benchmark districts. And we kind of nestle in the middle a little bit. We're a little bit above average 
And again, when I say above average, I mean uh, um, that's you. You'd want to be uh, at you know you sort of want to be average or below average if you wanted to be sort of ahead of the pack. So we're we're a little bit behind the average in terms of supporting our employees and devices, but not too bad. Um, trends in the process. Uh, over time, you can see that the upper left graph that we're again experiencing um, uh, more uh, trending upward of the tickets, but, but leveling off a little bit. These are the FY14 number of 6,439 is, is an estimation. Um, we won't know the actual number until the end of this fiscal year, but I'm, I'm estimating it to, to, to be about what it was last year. But you can see, our, and our turnaround time uh, is, is also about the same, but still both kind of on the high end um, historically. And then if you look at our customer satisfaction ratings, um, we, uh, this year with fiscal year 14, we're at 3.99, which is al almost exactly what we had last year of 3.98. Uh, we've, you can see a drop in our customer satisfaction over the last few years, but we've, I guess, stemmed the bleeding, so to speak. Um, we've worked hard at customer satisfaction in the last year. And even with our team's entire focus on that and working hard to how can we service our customers even better, than we've been in the past, we've really managed to just level it off. So we haven't been able to recapture the ground that we had in the past. So again, that, that feeds into some of the, the recommendation that I'm making that you'll see later in the presentation to um, help with some more support for the end users in the district. Oh, there's the goal. So the goal is 4.5. That goal was set actually, it's a tech DPI, a technology DPI goal that was set back when the ratings were up above 4.5 and we thought, well, that, we want to hold our ground at least at a minimum, if not improve. And then we've, we've had a hard time even holding our ground above 4.5 so overall satisfaction out of five. Um, just a review of some of the, these uh, tech plan drivers are actually summarized in the 2012 to 2015 tech plan. That's the three-year tech plan submitted to the state of Illinois. Uh, ours, uh, we have another one due, as you can tell, um, for next year we'll be working on the 2015 to 18 tech plan. But in the, in the current tech plan of 2012 to 15, um, th these are some of the key um, findings or, or uh, drivers that came out of that. Number, the um, item at the top to increase student access to devices. Again, a conclusion that this was drawn back in 2012. Um, to continue to work on um, digital curriculum development and, and procuring um, more digital uh, resources and then uh, work on principal leadership and training. That's one of the factors that the, the Project RED report has identified as key to any successful um, learning initiative that involves technology is to have the, the principal leadership and training as part of a major comp a component. And then teachers at the time, and they really still are requesting more opportunities for professional development and instructional support at the building level, which again is one of the recommendations we're making now. Um, the district infrastructure requiring investment, we've been working hard on that for the past few years, so I think we're nailing that one quite well. And then um, the technology staff continuing to try to improve processes and tools, which again, we've been working on hard, but uh, the last bullet point, this uh, sort of uh, follow-up point to that is, um, with the rate of technology growth, it's likely that we're going to need to add additional support, and I think we have probably even surpassed that point. So I think we're at the point where we need to we need to look at that pretty pretty hard. Um, I'm not going to go into details here. This just shows uh, this is what I showed you last year in terms of the plan for fiscal year 14 in terms of upgrading the network. And I'm happy to say that we have either completed all of that or it's it's in progress. We're some of the work has extended throughout the school year, so we're actually still have some work ahead of us. But we're almost done with all of those pieces and we've um, beefed up the network quite well, both internally and the, and the um, connections to the outside world. And then for next year, fiscal 15, um, and actually this is part of the recommendation that's in the consent agenda tonight, to buy some additional switches um, in, to put in the um, network closets of the buildings for the local area networks, and to add some additional um, high capacity, high speed wireless access points throughout the buildings so that every single classroom can, can, can basically support whole class activities with mobile devices without any network connection issues whatsoever and with a ample bandwidth to be able to do some very, uh, very nice work. And so with the recommendation that's on the consent agenda with that equipment and w throughout the summer and probably into the school year next year, we would finish basically the, the multi-year network infrastructure upgrade roadmap. Um, Turning to the people infrastructure side of things, so this is a new uh, component of the presentation to try to illustrate where we are with our staff in terms of technology support and instructional technology support. Uh, this really just shows where um, the recommendation to add one FTE of 
of um, technology support, and this is pure technology support, a technician um, would um, talk in uh, to, to be recommended at least to start with to be a technician that would help, help, help support the users throughout the district and the buildings. The way we have it structured right now is if you look at the upper um, rectangle, uh, the gray rectangle, the district tech level technology support, there's a number of staff at the district office or actually some of them actually are, are located at York High School but they serve the entire district so they they are either in their offices uh, doing central types of work or they might be in the buildings supporting some of the folks out and about the buildings but basically their span of where they really focus is the entire district. And then at York on the lower left th there are a couple of staff members, a senior technology support specialist and a and a technology su support specialist that really spend almost all of their time at York High School either su uh, supporting staff directly at York or working on initiatives in the York office but they're, they're really involved in a lot of activities at York High School. And then there's a, two tech support specialists that really try to cover the rest of the district. And as you can imagine, it's awfully hard for two people to go to say 11 or 12 buildings on a, at a frequency that's high enough to actually help people at, at, at the level that they need help. So the recommendation would be if we could get this additional support specialist that that person would help with the field work, so to speak, and, and have an additional, um, a, a, additional person helping out and also helping us with flexibility when people have vacations or on, you know, have sick, or the sick time off and things like that. Um, when it comes to the instructional side, as you know, um, currently we have the district instructional tech coordinator and that's Kathy Baker and she's involved in the a lot of things at the district level and high level planning, um, coordinating um, activities of librarians and, and tech, uh, TMAs, and you can see the list there. So there's a, a variety of um, training, professional development, support, um, insisting with folks at the district office, myself included, and, and, and that's been her role. And she also tries to get into the buildings and help with, with individual one-on-one -on -one or small group when she can. But it's awfully difficult, obviously, to reach uh, the number of staff that we have. Um, so that's our current situation and the proposed uh, enhancement of the instructional technology support would be to continue with, with the model which is the top uh, you know, district coordinator supporting the district level but also um, the at least to the elementary or early childhood staff and then have 4.4 of FTE of instructional technology coaches supporting um, all basically from grades uh, the buildings 6 to 8. At least this is a current view. Um, how the staff is actually deployed depend, you will, is you know, subject to some discussion. I think um, uh, Ms. Fitzgerald will have quite a bit of input on this, but we did have some uh, preliminary discussions with her, and she felt that a uh, setup where if we could get the 4.4 FTE for instructional coaching, um, having the 1.4 at York High School, as we discussed with um, the administration at York, and then 1.0 per middle school, focused primarily on those middle schools, and then they could provide some training opportunities. For example, if they're going to train on, say, Google Apps or on smart board training or some other, some other training that would apply, then, of course, elementary staff would certainly be welcome to participate or they might um, go to those schools. But their primary focus would be the middle schools. At least that's a, our current view. And then Kathy Baker would probably focus mainly at the elementary level. So all across the board, each of the levels would get an increase of attention and support compared to what they have today by a long shot. So that's roughly how that proposal looks. Um, in terms of deployment for next year, um, some of the key points are, and this is not comprehensive, but summary would be to simplify the District 205 Google Apps environment. Right now it's fairly complex and there's a task force that's meeting a few times this spring to define what that environment would look like next year so that it's more, more um, effective for students and teachers for, for learning as well as um, staff, other support staff in the district. And then at the high school, again, emphasizing Google Apps um, to focus on the communication, the collaboration, the creation, and the critical thinking that's a part of the Common Core. And then um, upgrading and el actually eliminating and converting over to Google Mail uh, from the old, uh, older system that we use for the students. And then expanding the Chromebook pilot slightly. I think right now, uh, I think there's a summary in another view graph. There's maybe, I think there's 160 devices now, so we would be um, taking a modest step uh, up from there to have, um, I think it's eight carts at York High School um, for in-school use. So the model would, would mirror the, the model this year at the middle schools where the carts stay in the schools and the students use them throughout the day. At the middle school, um, again, emphasizing Google Apps or EDU and um, expanding the current Chromebook rollout from, I think, um, 
I don't have a number at the top of my head. I want to say it's 200, about 200 to about to over 600. Uh, again, in carts for in school use, and um, really again with the instructional technology coaches available, if they can be made available, would really help with the, uh, the initiative at both the middle school and the high school. And then in elementary, um, possibly, I mean, basically the, the technology at the elementary level, just due to the refresh cycle, would more or less be the same as it is this year. Um, they, they went through some, ref, uh, some increases in access a couple of years ago when we, add, uh, when we added about 50% more laptops to the classrooms, I think it was two summers ago. So um, this year they would pretty much be the same as, or sorry, next year would be fairly, pretty much the same as this year. Um, we might, uh, we're talking or discussing uh, piloting Google Apps in grade five. I think there's also some interest at grade four, but we have a lot of discussion and work to do to, um, to branch into the elementary level with Google Apps. And then um, I think the hard work for next year was to develop a more detailed instructional technology plan for the elementary level for the, a multi-year plan. And again, working um, with um, the curriculum department and Dr. Fitzgerald to have a solid plan um, built next year. Uh, then a summary of the expenditures. The, the estimated original or estimated cost original is in the, the black numbers in that column was an original budget estimate that I brought to the Board of Education Finance Subcommittee about a month ago. Um, it was totaling at the bottom, you can see about almost $2.8 million. And then through some discussions, we talked about backing off slightly on the technology pro procurement um, and making some other adjustments in the budget to find other areas where we could um, reduce spending in order to free up some dollars uh, to be able to help staff some of the um, FTE that I mentioned earlier. And uh, so there'll be a summary table coming up, but this shows here that if we, if we can lower the expenditures, or at least the budget to 2.6 million, we can recover about $180,000 in, um, in, in uh, money to apply towards staffing there. And then the following year, similarly, about a 2.9, almost $3 million original budget uh, again, with some, some adjustments made over the last month to bring that down to about 2.84, 2.85, and come saving about $136,000. Um, there's a little bit of room in there to, find, to capture some more savings, but um, obviously this is a very preliminary budget since it's two years out. But I wanted to show you that there, some work was done to um, scale back a little bit. And um, it's, um, I do believe there is a little bit more room. We would, we would basically, the, the most room would show up in that first line out of the instructional tech for classrooms. That's the biggest area where I think we have room to scale back, but then again, that slows down our deployment. So we, we would need to discuss that over time. Um, this table summarizes the, the, uh, where the funding could come from for the proposed staff increases. Um, again, at, at the top of the table, if we could add 4.4 FTE of instructional technology coaches, and we assume an $85,000 loaded um, salary or loaded cost with salary and benefits, that's a little higher than is typically used for um, FTE, teacher FTE, but we wanted, we wanted to uh, plan conservatively and assume that we would have more experienced teachers involved. So with that assumption of $85,000, at York with 1.4, and at the early childhood through eight, 3.0 FTE of instructional support, that's the first two rows. And then if we could add one support technician at $60,000 of loaded salary, then we're at 5.4 FTE for a total of $434,000 of cost, annual cost. Um, and then where we could potentially capture some funds for that, again, the technology budget expenditure reductions of 181,000 next year and 136,000 the following year. And then the classroom technology um, fee increase that I believe is also on the agenda for tonight, um, that $15 increase with assuming a 6% student fee waiver rate, which is about where we are this year, so assuming a flat rate of, of uh, families applying for a fee waiver, uh, we would capture about $118,000 of revenue there, and we could apply that towards classroom technology and offset the cost of that. So then those two numbers, um, that's almost, what's that, $300,000 approximately there um, in fiscal year 15. So we would need $135,000 of other funding to reach the $434,000 mark. And I'm, I'm proposing, uh, or at least recommending, or requesting consideration on the discretionary staffing fund 
um, discussion to potentially uh, apply part of that to, to be able to help out with this issue. Or if that's not possible, then we would have to discuss as a, as a group um, how we might be able to accomplish the 4.4 or adjust, um, adjust as, as needed to, um, to fit our, our, our ability, our, our budget. Um, and the following year is similar math, just um, you know, reducing the budget, assuming the same tech fee revenue and some other funding uh, from uh, I don't know the discretionary staffing funds going to be available from year to year but another chunk of funding would have to be made available to support the rest of the um, $434,000 um, okay just again just to summarize considerations looking ahead again the, the people part I've, I've gone over um, the process looking ahead to park we do need to th think about logistics to support the growth in online testing. Um, one of the things I believe um, I've been hearing a lot lately is that we, we should be able to, and we're, I believe we're planning on um, giving a paper and pencil version of PARC the first round in the spring of 2015. I don't know that that's been decided, but I think that's, that's where we believe it may be headed or we may be able to head. So the technology component of that would, would not really kick in until the FY16 school year. Um, I'm not sure that that's lock and stone, but um, we definitely still have park ahead of us that we have to make sure we're prepared for. Um, trying to come up with better ways to uh, disseminate information. Um, the online, the Google Docs should be able to help, but there might be other tools that we can use to help with um, streamlining our workflows and making it more efficient and effective for teachers and students to, to work. Digital curriculum development, again, um, is a piece that would have to come along with as the mobile learning initiative evolves. And then obviously policy and procedure review and revision goes along with some of the changes in, um, in the use of technology in the district going forward. Um, uh, again, increased demand for devices is gonna be coming. The, the, I, you know, we're, we're gonna be facing this for the next few years, especially with the online assessments. We're gonna have to have a way to assess students without completely interfering with instruction involving technology. The data warehouse for analysis and reporting is something that we've been talking about a bit lately and I, I believe is still in, in consideration of discussion, but that's something that I believe is going to be needed if we're going to be able to do some of the, the work that's ahead of us with evaluations and so on, and also for helping students. And then cloud-based services will be growing in time, over time. I've been reading articles about how the, the traditional IT, IT infrastructure and tr traditional IT methods are really, um, kind of becoming, um, they're being um, surpassed at a rapid rate by the cloud-based technologies and services that are available. So I think we need to continue to look for ways that we can, um, we can move with that, with that uh, evolution in technology and evolve our own services, email, office productivity, even some of the other tools and systems that we run locally may be able to host offsite or, or find other um, infrastructure or services that we can um, uh, not necessarily have to maintain and purchase on a regular basis for uh, out of our capital budgets. Um, so that summarizes the next couple of years, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Kathy Baker's also here if there's something that's instructional related you'd like to ask. David, thank you very much. Um, I thought it was very thorough. It had a lot of the elements that we've been talking about um, for a while, um, you know, various different levels. So it was a great compilation, not just technology, but the application or integration of technology to education and curriculum instruction. So thank you very much for that. Um, it was a really good follow-up to that the mobile learning initiative, which we just had, you know, just a couple months ago. So there's, you know, great discussion, but great um, results you know, that, that you were able to provide showing us how it's, it's planned to move forward. Um, the one FTE for technical support, um, I just wanted to m make sure, my understanding is, you know, based on looking at all the charts and kind of where we are, um, that's really minimum. It's, it's still gonna be, um, if you're adding that many additional technical uh, um, coaches, then you know it's just one more technical support person. So just is that is that true that I'm still going to be? 
I, I think we're still, I think it brings us closer to the, to the, to the average or, you know, mm -hmm. closer to um, being um, in the middle of the pack for, compared to the comp districts. And um, so I think that's a step in the right direction. I don't know if it's going to be sufficient, you know, for years, but I think it's a good step yeah. for next year. Yeah. The other piece of it is um, that I, and I don't know if it will work out this way, but I think it will if we can have the instructional support coaches or instructional um, technology coaches. Um, I believe there will be some partnerships and some um, mutual benefits out of that in terms of the, the support team may be able to get some uh, information from folks who are in the building and have seen some of the issues firsthand and can describe them uh, in more detail or more effectively for us. I think sometimes um, staff, and I, I mean everybody I think has this issue from time to time, have a hard time explaining what happened or, or providing enough detail for the technology team, support team to actually help them very effectively. So I'm, I'm thinking there will be um, benefits in both, in, uh, in both directions. So I believe that the instructional technology coaches can actually help with the end user. I don't mean do the end user support. I don't, I don't mean to suggest that, but to be a resource and to provide information and to help us better serve the students and staff. So I think, I'm hoping that will help. And I, so I think if we can add one FTE of technician support and then partner with the instructional technology coaches to better serve the end users, I think we'll be better off. Thanks. Mm -hmm. That was good. I wondered, since we have, you said on about $300,000 already identified, uh, how do we move forward with the instructional technology coach? I, there's a job description draft, and what are the steps moving forward with that? Um, well, the, uh, I know that um, uh, Dr. Johns, um, Kathy Baker, and I think even um, Dr. Fitzgerald has been um, that uh, draft job descriptions have been shared with her for review. So that's being developed right now. Um, I, I don't know, I don't know if I can answer the question about how the, the, the um, position would be, how we would move forward on that. My, what I'm imagining is that a job description would be f finalized and then I think we would need a, a, some sort of approval to be able to, to post positions. Um, I think, I don't know whether that would be um, a partial a posting for a subset of the FTE that's being requested or the full amount, but because part of it might ha part of it involves in the discretionary staff discussion, and I, I know that won't be that won't be finalized for a little bit of time. So I, I don't have a great answer for you other than I think, um, you know, the sooner the better, obviously, when we post things. But but the, the, there is a little bit of time, and I, th I think that the, the job description is under development. So we're not quite ready at this point in time, but I think soon there would be something available. To, to post if it were approved. I don't know if that answers, I hope that answers your question. Dave, can I just add, uh, and, and Dave and Dave, we had had a conversation about whether this is FTE bodies or FTE portions of, of bodies. Is, is there, if you guys kind of figured that out, are these placeholders right now or? I think, and Dave, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think as we've talked about this, I think there's a desire to put in full-time positions. Um, th that seems to be a, a more effective model on some of the districts they have studied w on this issue. So, Yes, and, and actually we touched base briefly, um, very briefly last week with um, Dr. Fitzgerald, and, and she, she was of the opinion um, that it, it's more, it, it is more effective to have um, the dedicated staff in the building and to develop that relationship and to be, become part of the staff. I, I believe her opinion was, correct me if I'm wrong, Kathy, that um, in her opinion coming into this, what she would like to see would be the, the staff at York and then the 1.0 one one per middle school and then work out a, a sort of an, inter, you know, an arrangement where Ka Kathy might focus on the K-5 level with possibly some additional support from some of the instructional coaches um, on occasion, but not not as, a, not a, as a, a majority of their time or even a significant portion of their time would be how she would start. And then I, and I think she would, um, I, I really can't speak for her, but I got the impression that, you know, of course, if we were to evolve, the part, if we were successful and we were able to evolve, then of course you could provide additional support at the, at the EC5 level going forward. But the focus of the mobile lear learning initiative right now is grades 6 through 12. Not that we should ignore K, K5 or EC5, which is why we want to provide some some focused um, support there, some additional focused support. And if Kathy's focus can be narrowed or, you know, optimized maybe to in that level, that would provide some additional help that's not available there as often now.
So to, I mean, and just to, we talked about this a little bit in committee, but I was just sketching some numbers out. Since fiscal year 10, we've added 900 computers and 656 devices. So approximately 1,500 computers and devices to the network, and we dropped one FTE from field support. Is that right? Um, based on the, the um, run rate. We went from 7.5 to 6.5. Yeah, the, 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 um, the, the one FTE, yes, we did drop an FTE, and that was a combina we combined two positions. But, but, you, but you lost you lost, yes. you lost the equivalent uh, of one FTE yes. of support we while did. adding 1,500 devices that and computers correct. to the network. And now we're proposing mm -hmm. to add another 580 devices to the network. I don't think you can do it without the people. I, I just, I personally think that we have to, we have to, we, we invest millions of dollars in hardware. And okay, my personal editorial, I think we're underinvested in people. And I think as a community, we're wasting taxpayers' money by buying a bunch of devices, throwing it in a classroom, and hoping it works. And, and I have all the faith in the world that the teachers will figure it out. But I think we make it a lot more efficient if mm -hmm. we support it. And, and so, you know, my two cents is, is that. I don't think we have an option but to but to start, and you, you know whether the gap discretionary staff is funded out of a discretionary staff pool, which I think is intended to be committed for at least three years, so that will be there. Okay. Um, if it's not coming out of there, it needs to come out of the hardware budget. I, I just don't I just don't see throwing another almost 600 devices in the classroom without adding any support on top of the 1,500 you already, you already gave the staff. I, I just don't see where you're going to get the return on that investment. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, again, that's, that's my point. I, I just think we need to approve what we're doing. And sort of a follow-up to that is I, I think in some ways, um, with PARC especially, if that proceeds on the time, current timeline, I don't know that we have a choice but to add more devices into, into our buildings because otherwise you're shutting down um, instruction with technology for large periods of time during the school year. So. In a way, you're, we really don't have a choice but to add technology for student access. But, but in that case, you're, you're basically buying devices to take tests, which is a really crappy return for the community. I mean, yeah. I, I'm just, you're probably, what I we'll apologize be for the frustration, but it's like we have yeah. unfunded mandates coming out of right. our ears, and this is just one more of them. But well, we're sitting here with an opportunity to actually start to help our teachers use this technology, this, this wonderful opportunity that we have here. And I think we don't have a choice but to fund yeah. the, the people side of that. Um, or, or we're yeah. spending $3 million well, a year for, for incremental. I certainly agree with you on the people side. I do have a, 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 a piece of good news on the technology front that I, 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 I'm beginning to see how things could work in the future. We um, today at Sandberg, for the first time ever, used Chromebooks for map testing. We did one room, um, set up the Chromebooks, and allowed the students to log in. And it was very successful. It worked well. And um, the reason why I see that as um, sort of a milestone is because the way the devices, the way the devices were used was completely different than we've been able to do it before. The students literally could walk into the classroom, grab the Chromebook out of the cart, open it up, sit down, log in, and, and when the teacher said it was, or the proctor said it was okay, they could start map testing. So how that differs than what we've been doing up until that point is there's always this big effort to set up scores and scores of computers in every, every, you know, around the building and they're permanently sitting in those locations, wired in and connected in with switches or powered in with power cords. And they cannot be used for instruction at all during the day because they're basically dedicated assessment stations for the period that the map testing is underway. So what we've been able to do today at Sandberg, and we're going to now obviously parlay this into the other schools going forward, is the devices, uh, the devices that are instant onto the network and are very mobile and don't and have long battery life can literally just be used at that moment as an assessment device. In the very next period, this happened at Sandberg today, the very next period, they were put back from the cart, rolled into a room and used in an English class. So I think going forward, the, the, w what we w will be able to do is the technology that is, yes, it will have to be used for assessment, but it does not preclude the instruction. Uh, as, so it's, it's going to really be a very nice lightweight sort of uh, tool that can be recast into different roles very quickly. And we, I don't, really don't think we've been able to do that effectively in the past. So I, I do see that improvement going forward with some of these devices. Just, just thought I'd mention it because it is a, I think it's a, it's a big step when we look at the amount of assessment that has to sure. occur. Sure. Th thank you. So they're not just for – but I, I, I still mm -hmm. believe that if you don't put support with it, you're Correct. not going to get – you're going to get a fraction of what we spend on it out yes. of it. Yes. I agree. Okay. I just wanted to comment again. I, I think this is an excellent um, presentation, and it really covers, you know, it, it highlights the needs. 
And um, the one thing I want to call attention to, and this is in support of Chris's statement that he just made before, um, it's slide four on here where it's talking about it compared to Page and Kane uh, County districts compared to, uh, um, to Elmhurst. And we are by far, yeah, this is slide, we are by far um, understaffed from a, a um, FTE role where we are comparable <laughs> if even over is in computers. Yes. Sir. So the interesting part is we've got we've we've got ton we've got quite a bit a number of computers and we don't have people to help people efficiently use those computers which to me goes back to this this point on if we're thinking about if we have to make choices <laughs> on in technology on do we have people or computers? To me, this, this slide says we need people first. Understand we also would like to have additional technologies, but here, this highlights that we are way behind the curve uh, in people to help uh, mm -hmm. with this technology moving it forward. It's an excellent observation that we are, in fact, um, better than average, so to speak, when it comes to computers, or we have more computers available to students than we have a lower level of, of support. That is true, on average. As we add Chromebooks, though, do you, you see less support needed for those devices than what we've had before, laptops? So that helps this a little bit by going to a device that doesn't need as much manpower. Mm -hmm. I, but okay, Yes, I, I would agree. Um, our experience and our others' experience, I think, is that we can deploy them quick, more quickly. There's no software imaging involved and so on. There still will be some support from a, uh, just a break-fix standpoint, obviously. Um, and I think we're, the, you're gonna, we're gonna need more supporters on the instructional side because using the Chromebook, not so much because of the device, but because of the environment, the, using um, you know, Google Apps and um, the technology for collaboration creates a whole different environment in the classroom as you've heard from the teachers that spoke here a couple of months ago. So um, yes, but you, to your point, on the, just on the pure technician side, I think the Chromebooks are, um, uh, they're, they're, they, they require less effort to to maintain and deploy, other than the break fix. I think the break, from what I hear from other districts that have quite a bit of Chromebooks, you're prob we're probably gonna have about the same lev level of break fix that we need to do, the physical breaking, but the, the software management piece is much lower effort with Chromebooks. So what's next? Well, next on the agenda is discretionary uh, discretionary staffing and I think that this is a natural lead into that discussion okay but just in, in my point was regardless of what happens there I think we have a, we have a need to find the funding for this the question is is how does this make its way into a budget so I mean Chris I know there's a process where this comes to us and then you take it and put it into the budget as we start to formulate plans for next year, start to solidify plans for next year, is that, that would be where this would go. You would put this into the, the budget. So the next time we see this, it'll be loaded in. Well, I just want to know what we do with this. I mean, it, it, I mean, we went through this. We're going to talk a little bit about discretionary, but it's one small piece of the whole thing. How do we get this to what we're actually going to do, particularly in the light of job descriptions and hiring and people that are available and and, and, and all of that. So I, mean, I guess maybe I'm asking, uh, do you want to take this to the next topic and then come back to this or? I don't think you're going to, I could be wrong, but I don't think you're going to resolve in the next topic unless the board's going to recommend one of those discretionary staffing items tonight to move ahead. But I think what you could do is we could tentatively have David, I guess I have two questions. One is, David could certainly load in with the money that we already know we have through the changes in his budget and start putting those pieces in place sooner than later and put those in the budget because that's Dave's budget going in. So uh, with what you saw on that one page, he can certainly do that part of it. I guess the second item I'm hearing, I just want clarification, is there seems to be some concern about the level of purchase of Chromebooks at this point in time. If there's a desire for Dave to go back and pare down on the Chromebooks 
and, and start switching out personnel, then I think David needs to know that to rework his budget. If what he's presenting you tonight is acceptable to the board, then I can have David go back and, and start working with Chris to put those numbers in the budget for next year, knowing that discretionary funding is still hanging out there. But he can certainly get started on um, the portion minus discretionary stipend. So 181 plus 118, you've got um, almost $200,000 to start moving ahead with. 300,000. So if that's acceptable to the board tonight, we could move ahead on that portion tonight. Again, with what you want to do with the Chromebook numbers. But Chris, is this correct? You're saying we need to, the 4.4 .4 FTE we need, you're not saying to do, go beyond what's presented here? No, I'm just saying that in order to, to hire what's presented here, you're going to need $434,000. We've got 300 of that identified already, which you can go back and work on. The question is, do you wait on the other 135 till we have a discussion on discretionary and figure out what to do with it, or do we assume that we're going to go ahead and hire that, and if we don't get discretionary allocated towards it, that he needs to find it, do we want to send him back to look at his hardware budget to find the money to support these folks? Because I, I just don't, again, I just don't know whether you can add another 580 devices at the, you know, without, without adding that support job. Uh, yeah, the whole thing. I mean, it's, right. it's exactly Margaret's point when I look at it, too. I mean, we, we have invested heavily in hardware. We haven't invested in, in people. And, and so if you, if you had to pick a trade-off, the question is, do we, do, do we ask? To, and, it, and it really hit home for me when, when the woman from the other school, school district came up, and she said they actually started with people and, and bought hardware afterwards. We've already bought the hardware, so we're kind of backfilling with people. So, you know, I, I, so I, I guess that's... I'm trying to think of a way forward with this, but, but I mean, I, my suggestion would be to go ahead and plan for all 5.4, and if we can't find the money in discretionary, then we need to find the money in the tech budget out of hardware. But, but I, I just don't, I feel like we're throwing hard, more hardware. It's something that all the statistics show on our sheet here is starting to, uh, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't really want to wait for tr uh, you know, turnover to go up higher in the, in the technology department to figure out we've got a problem. The one, the one area where we have flexibility in, in the budget, because part of part of the expenditures are part of the um, consent agenda in terms of the leasing of the equipment. But um, the part that's really would be coming later as a purchase recommendation that I haven't even brought to the board. I would bring it probably in May. Would be the the 200. And f if you're looking at slide 14, the 200 and five thousand dollars of um, instructional technology is really chromebooks for the high school and middle school plus carts to put the chromebooks in so there there is um, the one area that's easiest to adjust is is that area but then of course that has the significant impact on on what happens in the classrooms in those buildings but that that's the two hundred thousand dollars right there that we could uh, we have the most uh, room to play with when it comes to um, finding funds for those positions in the technology budget. Dave, I'd like to hear your opinion about the question that Chris poses. If you added 500 and some odd devices, could you support them if you didn't get the discretionary funding added to your budget? Um, that's a great question. Um, I, I think it would be a, a challenge um, to, to, to support the proposed uh, technology uh, deployment for next year without some additional staff. I think it would be a challenge. I think we would have to relook at our deployment if we weren't able to fund the staff. Okay. All right. Thank you. That, I think that gives us a basis to, to uh, move forward on. Um, so we're clear we're going to include the first piece, the funding that you have for certain, uh, into the budgeting process. We're going to go through the discretionary staffing discussion. Um, and if that doesn't provide the extra 135000 then we'll go back and look at the trade-off between hardware and personnel. Mm -hmm. Is that what we agree upon? Yeah. Okay. okay. Dave, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Mr. Pernell? 
Yes, and talking about discretionary staffing, we might as well move right to that. Um, in your packet this evening, you have uh, survey results from uh, a variety of stakeholders throughout the district. Um, and I wanted to share that with you this evening. If you recall, I had talked about going to a variety of stakeholders across the district and getting their input into the discretionary staffing recommendations that we had talked about initially at the board table. And so what you have this evening is a um, summer, summary of that, those results uh, from a number of committees. The Futures Committee that I meet with once a month, uh, the PTA Council, uh, PSRP representatives, uh, Lamer Management Council, uh, the district leadership team, and the administrative team. And you can see the rankings, both of those individual groups, and then an overall summary on the far right-hand side of how those issues were ranked. A couple of caveats just to mention to the board in looking at the results. Uh, these are snapshots of input from those groups. It doesn't represent the total employee groups. It doesn't remember all staff, but it is a representative group that was asked to give input into this. The other caveat is sometimes when you do this kind of ranking, some things will resonate with some groups and not resonate with others. And that's not an interpretation of the value that one group may have on another. It's just that at times, it's not an issue in one particular group that they, that they deal with, but in other groups, it becomes a higher priority. And there's a couple of those I would just you know point out. I think one, when we have talked to staff about 504 coordinator, if you look at it from the counselor's perspective, that if you would ask them, that is a very high ranked issue with 504 coordinator at the high school and middle school. But for most groups, that's not an issue because they don't have that day-to-day -day experience with 504s, so it's not an issue. I think the other one is administrative interns, TOSAs. I think that's another one that if you're not dealing with it day-to-day, -day, uh, it's not as big an issue as some of those other things. But needless to say, there are some things that I think that clearly there's a consensus on uh, with that and one of them you know rank number two is the one we just talked about instructional coach and tech support seem to be from all the stakeholder groups one that resonated fairly high across all groups the other one that that ended up number one there was a little more variance with that one but uh, just in a couple groups was math interventionists uh, so there is in it if just to recall for the board we, the board, this district has hired reading specialists a number of years ago, and we have about 20 dedicated staff for reading specialists across the district. Uh, in the past history, there was a decision not to hire math specialists. So you have uh, teachers who support students who are needing intervention in reading and language arts, but you don't have anybody on staff who can address math interventionists. So I think you're seeing a response to that decision of not having math interventionists uh, coming up as a high support. The third one, and I think the board heard this last year when you did school visits and had lunches with the staff, was the class sizes at the middle school and high school. There was some concern about the size of some of the high schools. I think uh, York staff in particular, I think, shared their concerns with that, especially in some um, curriculum areas. So that came up uh, number three. Number four, the psychologists. We talked about this one, the, the dual role that psychologists are used in the, in the district. Uh, that also came up pretty high. And then finally, the 504 coordinator. So that's kind of a summary of, of where those are ranked. And you can see the ranking yourself. So you can see, uh, if you look at the numbers too, you can, you can kind of see where the emphasis was for each group. What I would probably look for tonight, and this is at the pleasure of the board, but my suggestion for next step would be for the board to come to consensus on what five, four or five, obviously we can't fund all these. I mean, that's, that's the difficulty right off the bat. You're not going to be able to fund these uh, on any level across the board. But to come up with three, four, five that you would like us to flesh out uh, to bring back for recommendations. For example, you just talked to David. If, if 
you know, the, the coaching is one of those. We would complete the job description. We would talk about how they're going to be utilized specifically, what their job duties would be, bring that back to the board, and then have a final decision on, on, on uh, recommendation for moving ahead with staffing. Uh, obviously, uh, you can't do all of these, so I would try to narrow that down, and then we would bring back how when, however many the board would like us to see, knowing that some of these I don't think are going to move on uh, past the discussion tonight. So that would be the discussion that, uh, you know, I think would be advantageous to the board to have tonight. So are there any questions about the survey before we get any further? I, I, I love this. I think this is a great survey. Would you mind just clarifying, um, some of these are, are pretty clear who's on there. Like the PTA council is very clear. Would you mind clarifying who's on the future committee and or I don't know if the PSRP would be clear to everyone that might yeah. be listening. Yeah, uh, the Futures Committee is a cross-section of staff. There are about 25 members on my Futures Committee, and it's a cross-section of staff who volunteer to uh, meet with me uh, every other week to talk about planning for the future innovation. So I put that survey in front of them. It kind of fit in with the discussion we were having about future steps in the district. Uh, the PSRP, we meet with uh, PSRP uh, representation once a month, and we, I, I pass this out to that group. So there are about eight PSRP members that I think uh, were, were part of that. So, and they are the union leadership across the district, and so we passed it out to them, and that was their ranking. Uh, DLT is just the district leadership team, just those at one representative, uh, from every b building from a teacher and we meet uh, once a month on that so that was that makeup any discussion somebody want to lead off and voice an opinion of their top five Karen there is some thought um, around the, if, if you look at a minute, it's, it's around function versus title, if you will. Um, it's looking at it in a, maybe a different way or collaborating. Uh, the administrative interns, TOSAs, the 504 coordinator, the in, increased psychologists across the district, th there's thought that, um, you know, maybe you could help uh, in, in all those areas, you know what I'm saying, together. Um, one example is when, when Dave uh, showed his presentation, he talks about, um, you know, data management. Um, and so there's a lot of work, I know that Meg has said, um, with a psychologist, there's a lot of data aggregation and analysis that if we, you know, were to uh, continue with the technology and, you know, data management, if you will, if we could look at that digital workflows and offload some of that um, tedious kind of things that could be done te technology-wise, could we help in that area? Kind of redesigning workflow versus just keep, keep adding the head count or looking at it the way that we traditionally do. Well, I think the answer is yes. Given enough time, we could certainly, you know, look at workflow. We could look at job descriptions. We could look at the impact of technology. That's probably not going to be something I can deliver to the board in the next few weeks, but it's something that we could discuss. And I think uh, for some of these, for example, I'll just pull out math interventionists. I don't believe that's going to be one, and I could be wrong. I think the board's going to want to know how that could be configured, as, as Karen pointed out. What can we do with that? How can we reconfigure what our present resources are? So still making that a priority of some kind, but I don't think that's going to be one that you're, I would recommend that we fund right this minute because you can't deliver 20 math interventionists tomorrow. You don't have, that's not what the $400,000 is going to give you. So I think that's when you say, you might want to say, Dave, we think that's a priority. We would like you to come back and study that one and come back with a plan in the future of how we might add that component to the intervention program across the district. But I just don't think 
you know, hiring one or two math interventionists is going to have a big, big impact at this moment in time in the near future. In the far future, yeah, I think that's one you can study. I think probably psychologists, and that would be another one. If we purchase a data warehouse, what does that free up? What does that do for the psychologists? Uh, will that have an impact? And, you know, I'm not going to know that until we start studying what a data warehouse does, bringing psychologists on board to help us study with that, and then take a look at it. And we've kind of talked about that already administratively. And then the only other piece was um, I know that e both at the Niles presentation that they presented here and um, the presentation that we went to for IASB um, dinner where two districts were talking about how they um, used instructional coaches and in technology integration of cur curricular instruction, they said that they were able to help with their issue of class size. So I'm curious as to the overlay of, if we say class size reduction at the middle school and high school, what specifically is that? Not that I need to know, but do we overlay that with where are we going to deploy the technology and the next layer of the pilot? And could we potentially help with both of the issues by looking at it that way? I, I can't envision that right now, Karen. Maybe there's some way to do that, but I think the instructional coach is going to be just that, a coach, and I'm not sure that's going to address class size in any significant way, at least initially. I do think on the class size issue, I think what we'd like to do is work with the secondary administration, look at the class sizes going into next year, and then look at specific areas and perhaps make subconscious decisions about what areas we want to lower that we think are high based on curriculum or content or demands on the teacher for instruction in those particular classrooms. So it's not that you're going to lower class size overall because again you can't afford that. But I think what you want to do is say what are the content areas that we really want to look at or the curriculum offerings that we think what we're trying to accomplish in that curriculum area those class sizes are too high and we need to lower those. You know, one example would be if we have a class that has a lot of writing it's a language arts class and there's a lot of demands for students to write. In fairness to the teacher, I think you want lower class size because just the demand of grading papers in that class is probably m much more significant than perhaps other classes. So if there's a requirement that kids will be writing 10 papers during the semester, uh, you multiply that by 35 kids. That's a big load for a teacher. In those classes, you may want to target for lower class size. That's just one example I'm pulling off the top of my head. I don't know if that's true or not, but that would be just an example of how you could address class size in kind of a surgical kind of way. I'm going back to, I think this, this is a very, I, I understand the caveat that this does not represent all, <clears throat> all staff, all um, parents, but I think this group you have is a very representative sample. And I say that in the sense that I believe they have highlighted what their overall focus is. And I, to me, in moving forward, it's, you know, how deep do we go here? Do we go um, top four or do we go top five? Um, but I, my vote would be to stay true to what the overall rank is. And I think those ones, the overall rank have been what we've heard, you know, continuously. We've heard about the, you know, STEM and the need for STEM, and that, I think, speaks to math interventionists. We've heard consistently about technology, and that speaks to the uh, instructional coach and the tech support. We've, we've heard about um, class size reductions, and again, how we manage that, I'm not sure, um, but that is something we consistently hear about through um, from parents and teachers. And the other piece that I think we were cautioned it might not make the list, but again, it got quite a few, you know, second and third place votes are the psychologists mm -hmm. um, and what their role is. And I think they got two number two votes and a number three vote um, from, you know, I think there's six of these groups that were tallied. So I think that to me, those are my top top four. Anyone else have a top four, top five? Shannon?
I, I agree. I, I don't want to go too far. I, I think five is too many. I mean, we're talking about $400,000 mm -hmm. for three years. It's not a whole lot of money, but it's, you know, we can get a start on some of these things. So I don't want to dilute it too much, the, the $400,000. But I, I agree. This is a representative sample of, of our community. And it's what we've been talking about, too. It seems like it's all coming together here with this survey. Yeah. Can, can I toss in a opinion? Would, would anyone mind? Um, <laughs> yeah, you haven't talked about it. <laughs> yeah, it's not in the job description, really. But if, but if I can just intervene for a second. Um, the administrative interns in TOSIS, I mean, I can understand why, why that mm, yeah. doesn't uh, rank highly. However, you know, I, I think as we've discussed at length at other times, um, we have some principles that uh, we endanger burning out from the number of evaluations they have to do to comply with the law that has been provided to us with, of course, no resources that went along with it. Um, so I, I think we need to help boost that up a little bit. Uh, and that would certainly be in my top five. Now, we can have a discussion, and I'll finish with my other four, but uh, Emily, you had something to say. Well, I mean, here we, here we go. The top five is getting bigger, because I was going to just mention 504 coordinator. And I just feel like from um, oh God, all the acronyms, ETC, LMC, and just maybe as the York liaison, I just keep hearing 504 over and over. And of course, if it didn't show up, you know, at a higher rank than five, then maybe that's just who I've happened to hear from. But I just wanted to see, and if the rest of the board members don't agree and don't want it to be in the top four, you know, I'll go along with that. But I just wanted to throw that one out there that I feel like I keep hearing a lot about that one. Anyone else? Want me to chime back in? I mean, I, I personally, I th when we look at the math interventionalists, I, I would uh, I would take Dave up on his offer to study that a little further, figure out uh, how we could introduce that, um, you know, using some existing resources, and if that's not possible, exactly what the price tag on that would be. Um, but you know, as Dave said, even though that comes out to be number one, I think that also comes with a very very large price tag. Um, to do it as a as a specialist, and I would be open to hearing other ideas about how we do it with some existing resources. Um, and then I would also take a look, as I said, about the administrative uh, interns and TOSAs to help with some of this evaluation support. I fully support the instructional coaches in, and tech support. I think we talked about that. Uh, I think that we can uh, make great academic gains by supporting that. Um, I, I think we should ask Dave to uh, take a look at what the addition of a data warehouse would do to the workload of our psychologists and, um, and, and the 504 coordinators. I, I don't know if that would be an impact or not, but, but I'd sure like to hear our, our administration's uh, question about that, and I also support the idea of uh, could we provide some resources to, I mean, if we can't reduce, you know, all class sizes, you know, at the high school and middle school, what uh, what could we take a slice of this and uh, and effectively reduce? Um, and and I think those. Hang on, let me make sure that that encompasses. That's six. Is that six? Okay, well that that encompasses as well. Yeah, well, my top five is six because the number the the, uh, the math interventionalists, I mean, is you're realistically not going to be able to support 20 people. Go ahead. We've talked about having expanding the role of the reading specialist, which we have in place. So maybe at the beginning, it's you're not adding any headcount; you're changing a job description, maybe some professional development. I don't know exactly, but we we talked about expanding the role to learning consultant. And that's exactly the reason I have six in my top five. 
That is my math right there. All right, who else wants to jump in? Jen? It strikes me that the class size reduction is a bigger topic than this being one of several things that can be done with this small amount of money. Um, I think we also saw that the tech, you know, the vision of tech that we've been introduced over the last few months that, that seems to be uh, gaining a real foothold um, also was a large thing and we're making trade-offs, appropriate trade-offs to address that with a deeper load of resources. Um, and so I would just, despite its top three rank, and it is a popular thing, I think it's probably better resolved through another uh, venue than this small pool of strategic resources. Um, I don't know why, but the I found the arguments about the use of psychologists uh, compelling, and I don't have any more deeper rationale than that. Um, and I, I'm not sure if that would tie into hiring a 504 coordinator or not. Um, but those are just my observations, but I am also very sensitive that we need to support our principals the way we need to support our teachers. And so despite, as Jim said, it's seven overall rank, I think there's an important need there and I'd urge looking at that. Margaret? The one thing I, I like, um, and we've thrown out a lot of ideas, um, but I like the idea if we, we, if we narrow it to five or six, but, and then let the administration come back to us and say what they, you know, how they might be able to make this work. So ideally, um, or this is a option, one thing that could come back, the instructional coaches was number two. Maybe an ideal will come back that um, we are going to, we can find this money within our budget somewhere. So that issue could be resolved. But I, I like staying somewhat true to the ranking of the people of the staff that we've had. I certainly understand and appreciate the TOSA role, and uh, especially with um, all the additional, eval additional evaluations that are going on. I understand that. But again, I think if we kind of narrow this, there might be other creative approaches that the administration might come back with us. You know, maybe they'll come back and say, you can, ha you can get this data warehouse and it'll, um, cost this amount of money and it'll resolve these issues. You know, I don't know that. Um, but, you know, the people that are close to that might be able to explain those uh, issues for us. Well, let me, yeah, let me just, if, if I can recap what I think I'm hearing. Um, <laughs> um, Tech coach sounds like solid support. Uh, study math interventionists, see if there's a way we can start to address that, but uh, probably not going to be uh, instituted as 20 math interventionists, but something for future study. Class size, uh, I'm not sure about this one, if you want to selectively look at it or put it on the shelf for a, a whole different discussion. I heard both sides of this one, so. I would vote for selectively look at it. I would too. What, what is the rest of the board? Two for selectively, three for selectively. Is Dave, was four that, for selectively. Did we say previous meetings it was freshman classes, or is it just, it, it, we, it's not narrow? I, I think for the high school, it was some of the core classes, some of the high core academic classes were having pretty high class size, uh, math department, uh, English departments, so looking at that. Is that, yeah, do we have consensus that's something we want Dave to pursue, okay? Uh, psychologists, um, looking at that and whether there's a, again, a reconfiguration, maybe looking at 504 coordinator tied with that, uh, looking at how we can address that along with what's gonna happen with the data warehouse. 
And so that data warehouse process, we are starting to explore. We can bring the psychologists on board in that exploration and get their input on how we can utilize that and how that would free them up for more um, time with, with students. And then on the, kind of on the side, but looking at it, not totally giving it up, is administrative interns, TOSA, um, but having that one at least come back for consideration. But again, it's not ranked real high with the whole group, but keeping that one alive. That's what I heard. Chris? What Dave said. But um, the one, one question that I have, though, is in the context <laughs> of psychologists, in, in reading, we had an email at some point in time with kind of what psychologists do. And I, and I think the first thing we need to do is actually have a job description that appropriate reflects what a psychologist yeah, it, is. Because I'm guessing that TOSA's overlap, if you took workload right. data warehouse, may overlap. I mean, I, I think that you've got that. Uh, you know, if you were to find the psychologist's role as what it is, there, there may be some overlap with, with some of these other spots. But I, those are my five. So. Janet, go ahead. Okay. The, no, Anybody disagree with that, I guess? I, I, Personally, I think the, the, the only sentiment in there that I disagree with is uh, I think you're de-emphasizing the TOSAs a little too much. Okay. Uh, well, it, I, I mean, we... <laughs> We will come back with a thorough study of the TOSAs, just like we do with all of this, and come back with what it may look like. Didn't mean to de-emphasize the TOSAs. I just didn't hear the kind of consensus. You always get in trouble trying to interpret your board. Go right ahead, please. We talked a little bit about the data warehouse. What? Well, I guess I can wait till it's going to come up with the curriculum committee. Do you want to just wait? Yeah, to it's going to come up with the curriculum committee, and it's also going to be part of the capital expenditure dis discretionary discussion. So that's the next discussion to have. Um, but, but I think it's going to come up sooner or later. So. Okay. okay. Do we have everything we need on that subject? I believe so. Thank you. Okay. Um, the only thing, well, here, you have. Do you still have two topics left. Yes. Uh, I'm going to turn update on levy, EAV, and tax extension and rates to, with, with Chris, and then I'll finish up with our FOIA request. Um, we received the final 2013 tax extension and rates from DuPage County. Um, what we have on the screen here is the, the 2012 extension and rates. Then uh, the 2013 tax levy. The um, when we did the when we do the tax levy, we don't know um, what the new construction EAV um, is going to come out. So we conservatively estimated that at 45 million when we did our levy at a 4.03 percent increase for capped funds overall 4.22. We, at the same time, though, we also did an estimated extension based on our estimate of $22 million in new construction EAV, which had a 2.84% increase on cap to 3.24% overall. Um, the actual extension um, resulted in a 2.81%. That is, uh, that was with new construction EAV of $20 million. 943,340 with an overall tax extension increase of 3.21%. Um, that 3.21% in, in includes the new construction EAV, but existing property should see an increase closer to 2.25% um, with, with, without the new construction. And, and that was a 1.7% CPI. That's that's all I have today. Any questions, Chris? One congratulations for being so close. Thank you. Uh, impressive. Um, two, I just want to point out that um, the the cap funds grow at CPI plus new construction. Um, so as a, as an existing homeowner, your your tax bill 
for the operating portion of the cap funds goes up at CPI. That said, the bond and interest is going up at 7%, and those are principal and interest commitments that have been made in you know eight to 10 years ago when bonds were issued. So we have talked about this before, about how that principal maturity schedule was back-end loaded. It's something that we're keeping an eye on. There is a refinancing opportunity <clears throat> at, at a very low premium, I think, coming up this fall. So we've got that as our window to kind of reevaluate and talk to William Blair, our, our bond uh, advisor, on it. But I, I just want to point out that you know, there's always this question about what, why are my taxes going up at, at more than CPI if I'm capped at CPI? And, and in, in this case, the answer is the bond interest is not capped at CPI. So I just want to point that out. The other thing to point out is the bond and in interest is approximately one-tenth of the amount of the capped funds. So one-tenth of the bill is going up at 7 percent. John. Are those broken out in separate line items on people's tax bills so that people can follow along? Yeah, the, the levy's broken out? Yes, the, the debt service, I believe, is, is, is separate on the tax bill. But the, I think the capped funds has just two lines, a pension and a non-pension part of the capped, and then I think a debt service, I believe, is the way the tax bill reads. Anything else? Okay, let's move on. Finally, this evening under uh, superintendent communication, just uh, we had three FOIA requests. They were all granted. One was regarding specific bid results. Uh, one was asking for collective bargaining agreements, operating budgets, and salary information. And the final one was asking for specific scheduled summer work. Karen? Dave, we don't get any more information about why the uh, the BGA was asking us for this information, what they were going to do with it, and no, those FOIA requests don't don't come that way. So we often don't know why the information is being requested. That was very interesting. I don't know if anybody else noticed that. Anything else on the superintendent's agenda? And let's move on to approval of board meeting minutes from March 25th, 2014 and April 8th, 2014. Are there any changes that the board would like to make to those minutes? Karen? I just made a, a minor change that I sent to Ellen, which it's on page three, and it removes the vision and mission statement. It was a unifying statement, that's all. Okay. Then uh, with that proposed change, we'll let those minutes stand as submitted. Okay. Um, and next is the reorganization of the Board of Education, which is an annual event um, by our uh, policy. Uh, so I need a nomination, a motion for a nomination of a president pro tem for this session. Mr. Bloom. I'd like to nominate Mr. John McDonough as president pro tem. Do I hear a second? Emily seconds. Um, do I need a roll call vote? Mrs. Walsh, do you know if I need a roll call vote or we just know? Excellent. Uh, all in favor? Say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Mr. McDonough. Can I have a gavel? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Uh, may I have a nomination for president of the Board of Education? Mr. Bloom. I would like to nominate Jim Collins for president of the Board of Education. Is there a second? I'll second that. Nominated by Mr. Bloom and seconded by Dr. Harrell is Mr. Collins. Are there any more nominations for president? Hearing none, we have one candidate. All in favor of Jim Collins for president of the Board of Education? Say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, Mr. Collins is elected president. And I must turn over to the newly elected president. 
Well done, John. <laughs> now we need a nomination for vice president of the board. Karen? I'd, not, I'd like to nominate uh, Shannon Ebner. Are you a second? I'll second. All right. Moved by Karen, seconded by John. All in favor? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. You're absolutely right. Any other nominations for vice president of the board? Thank you, Chris. Hearing none, all in favor of Shannon for vice president? Say aye. Aye. Opposed? Shannon, newly elected vice president of the board. Now we need a nomination for the secretary of the board. Emily. I nominate Karen Stupin. Second. I'll second it. Okay. Nominated by Karen Sufin, nominated by Emily, seconded by Chris. Any other nominations for secretary of the board? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? And Karen remains as secretary of the board. All right. Um, and then we have the proposed meeting schedule. Everyone have the opportunity to take a look at that? Um, the only thing I'd throw out there is there is a meeting Thanksgiving week those first two days Monday and Tuesday is parent teacher conference meetings did that pose a challenge to anyone this past year do we want to keep that meeting it is a long way away all right not hearing any objections we'll keep that meeting um, does oh I'm sorry Emily, go ahead. Um, this year, it sounded like it was something new to have the two meetings in March, and they were both really short, but do we want to, I mean, you want to keep doing that? Um, I would suggest this for both of these. I would keep them on the schedule right now, but then as we get closer, uh, we can always decide to consolidate a meeting and eliminate a meeting. Uh, and I, I think because you never know what issues are going to come forward and then sometimes if you only have one meeting that month you really are looking for two especially with hearings that are coming forward and everything like that so I would suggest to the board keep these but then we can as an administrative group look at those two specific dates and start planning around those with the idea that we may eliminate either one or both Shannon one other thought too when we had the meeting April 8th it was a light meeting and then I would like to start moving more toward workshop meetings and that would have been a perfect opportunity to throw in one of the workshop workshop topics so if the board we can get one of the parking lot with along with Dave's help parking lot issues and then we throw those topics in when there's time and I think it would make make a lot of sense to do that and take advantage of those lighter meetings I, I agree. I agree. Uh, I am all in favor of short meetings, but uh, you're right. It's an opportunity to cover a lot of ground. Mm -hmm. So, um, shall we let the uh, the meeting schedule stand as submitted? Okay. Um, that uh, then brings us to board committee appointments. And uh, here's what I believe we have. Um, and please let me know if anything, uh, you'd like anything changed in this. Board Improvement Committee, Shannon, Karen, and Jim. Curriculum Committee, Shannon, Margaret, and John. Uh, finance, Chris, Emily, and Karen. Performance Management, Karen, Shannon, and Chris. Policy Committee, John, Emily, and Margaret. Our LEND representative, Karen. Our SASID representative, Emily. Our IASB representative, Margaret. Our Lizadra Museum representative, John. And the City Park Schools uh, representatives, John and Chris. That I got everybody's interests reflected uh, accurately. Okay, I can send all that. Yeah. Uh, let's let's try to keep the gaveling to a minimum. Um, let's see here. All right, takes us to board committee reports. The first is curriculum and instruction. Shannon. 
the committee met on April 10th and we talked about how uh, we're looking at long-term assessment planning, the park tests, the map tests, common core standards, um, common assessments that are created by our teachers. How does this all fit together? So this is going to be an ongoing discussion. Keep this continuously going because as we get changes from our state board and we hear more from park, we'll, it's going to be constantly changing. So what we talked about that night was how our teachers, our staff have aligned our curriculums to the Common Core standards. Uh, the map tests that our students took this year were aligned to the Common Core standards. And the park test is also aligned to the Common Core standards. So we talked about a, a scenario for testing for our students. Uh, the younger grades would be two map tests per year. This is all proposed. You know, just, I'm just recapping our discussion two map tests per year and then two part tests. So the map tests would be September and January, followed up with part testing March and May. So that's proposed for now. Um, map allows us to have a history while park is getting started. Um, let's see what else we talked about. Uh, the next topic we talked about was our teacher evaluations in 2016 will have a student growth component. And we discussed what the test would be that the, this, how do you test student growth? What would, what would that be? Map testing, park testing. Well, you can't use park because it's too late in the year. Uh, and then we talked about common assess or assessments that teachers create. But that's more of a long-term project, creating assessments that can measure student growth. We don't have all of that right now. But the MAP test can assess student growth, so it was proposed to uh, initially use MAP testing when, when the time comes to add a student growth component f to teacher evaluations. Again, this is all preliminary discussions. Charles, do you want to add anything here? If, do I have anything wrong? Okay. Um, oh, the other thing I wanted to ask was we talked about doing a curriculum update to talk about some of these issues to our community, and I know it's a big job, but uh, we talked about doing this in May. Yes, we're looking to have a, an event to uh, update the community on the implications of PARA, that's the teacher evaluation uh, legislation, and PARC, which is this assessment, and then the intersection of the Common Core has with PARC. Uh, we're still coming up with a, a, a name that is attractive sounding, uh, but we're looking so people come, but uh, we're going to hold the event here on May 19th. Moving on real quick, uh, ELL audit report, Karen Mulateri provided a summary of the audit. Uh, there are 51 items that were looked at in our district for the ELL program, and 11 of these items uh, need some further action items. 40 items were fully implemented, so uh, you know that was good. And they've identified what action items need to be accomplished. And that was included in our board packet. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm seeing that the the audit is in the administrative content, and I'm wondering if that's something that is it preliminary, such that we're still working on it, or somebody's still working on it. I guess it was done by ASB. Well, yeah, the the audit is oh, um, that's what's included were the eleven items that need to be addressed. It wasn't the full audit. Is that is that right? Yeah, we did not include the full audit in what's in the administrative folder. Uh, we're also in the process of communicating this with the staff, so we were hoping to delay delay a little bit. And we actually haven't completed our response to the ISBE, so this is really work in progress that okay. we shared as an, as an update okay. with the subcommittee. All right. I, I think, um, given the history of everything we went through, I think as soon as we can get that out there, I think it would be a, a good thing to do. 
We have uh, a session, the, the nearest late arrival opportunity is May 7th, and so we're having a session at the north end of the district where the, the most uh, staff is, is implicated yes. by the ELL and bilingual program. Great. Thank you. I also have a, a question. Um, the community event, and I know there's already quite a bit of information that's going to be covered in that, but I'm wondering somehow if it can just be touched on um, the audit because I, the staff certainly need to hear it, but the community, it, it created quite a bit of um, angst, concern. I was trying to find a, a yes, and I couldn't find one. So um, it, it created quite a bit of angst and concern, and I think it would be nice just to get you know, some closure on that issue. So if we could somehow make sure the community uh, would be updated on that. Sure, I think that's a fabulous idea. Thank you. The last topic, because we've already talked about in, in technology coaches, is data warehouse. We talked about, or Charles Frendel talked about how to implement the data warehouse, and when we have teacher evaluations that are tied to student growth, there's really no way around it. You, you need to have this system in place. So if we can start some small, steps now with the data warehouse and then when you have teacher evaluations with you know, student data involved you would be in a position to handle that that type of project that's it okay any questions for shannon then we can move on to finance and operations chris thank you um so the finance committee uh we went through a number of topics uh march monthly financial reports uh chris welton presented we are on plan on budget i guess that's how you win the certificate of excellence five years in a row thank you chris um technology presentation uh we went over earlier um electricity update from frank that is one of the items within the budget that is varying over over budget um we talked about, um, we had a fixed contract for 30 months. Uh, we had fixed our electricity prices that had, had ended and we were floating. Now Frank has an opportunity to fix the, uh, uh, to buy electricity forward uh, for, he, he had shown us a few options. He's going to go refine those options, issue an RFP to multiple uh, suppliers. And um, I think what we uh, had agreed to do because in the past what they'd done is um, we, we would ask them for a bid that they had to leave open or make good for a period of three or four days up until the next board meeting. And they, there's a hedge cost associated with that, that that we pay. I think similar to the way we do our bond refinancings, we talked about having the board approve a, kind of a parameters resolution, if you will, which said that, you know, a not to exceed number. And, and as long as he's you know, creating competition amongst bidders uh, to take the low bid not to exceed a certain number. So that would be a future board meeting that he would bring that to us. Um, so we talked about that. Um, the tax extension EAV, um, we did point out that um, Chris Welton was very close on his estimate. Congratulations again. Um, the insurance renewal um, will be coming to the board. Um, I think preliminary numbers are, you know, mid single digit increases, but I, I think we wanted to wait till the whole package is done and it'll come to the board. Um, the IMRF, uh, Chris had given us an update on the contribution rates. It has dropped to 11.09%. Um, you will recall that we talked about there was an, a significant unfunded portion of the IMRR, IMRF obligations, unlike TRS. Uh, they, um, they run a fully funded plan and they send us back the portion that's not funded and they charge us interest on that. Um, and, and it varies between overfunded and underfunded. And um, of course, unfortunately, more lately it's been underfunded. But the 11.09 drop from 11.82, a, a big chunk of that is a reduction in the underfunded status for us. So it is getting better. We're continuing to monitor that. Um, and then uh, there were some, uh, some updates. Um, number one, uh, discretionary staffing we talked about. Uh, number two, on the stormwater side, um, we looked at updated drawings from Madison. I think the answer there is that some portion of that field will need to be used in the event that we would do an expansion of that. So our discussions with the city 
uh, would be around a footprint and, and, a, and, a, and a design for that space, which would um, envision us being able to take back a portion of that. I don't know whether it's for parking or playground or, or kind of where the, but the flexibility would need to be included in whatever happens, whether we use uh, you know, permeable pavers for a portion if we needed to rebuild. I, I don't know the answer to it, but the point is, is that the space that's there, a portion of that will need to be reclaimed at some point if we were to do an addition to Madison. Um, and then the, uh, the, the third piece, um, the update on, on impact fees. I have been talking with Kevin York um, at, at the city, the finance uh, committee chairman for the city, walking through numbers. Um, there are a couple of different types of fees. Um, the fee that we're talking about is typically referred to more as a transition fee. The way the city ordinance is constructed right now, it is constructed as a transition fee, meaning it is a fee to cover the cost of the, the student that shows up on our doorstep for the year before we get the tax. So if somebody moves into a house, a brand newly built house, they receive their certificate of occupancy, it's a year before. They live in it for a year. The tax bill is issued. It's a year before we receive revenue for that. And, and so the gap fee is, is that portion of the fee is intended to bridge that gap. So it's typically about what it costs us per year. And in the ordinance, there is, uh, there's not a formula, but there are the metrics that refers to our cost to educate and the number of students that we get. Um, and, you know, we're having a discussion about what the right number is as far as percentage of the house is occupied. Uh, I, I, we have asked um, the city and Chris and, and Tom Trezine are working to the city to get us um, recent certificate, or certificate, certificate of occupancies for new residential construction going back over some period of time. Um, and we will be able to bounce those addresses up against our student roles to see how many houses or how many students those houses generated. Uh, to give us some more quantitative data rather than kind of sticking your finger in the air. I mean, intuitively, a four-bedroom, three-bath, $800,000 house isn't typically purchased by single folks or retirees. So intuitively, you would think that there would be a significant portion of those homes occupied by folks with kids. Um, but again, I, I think that um, you know, the discussion's ongoing with the city. We're you know, very open in, in, in talking about that. The second piece of the fee, which the city does not currently have an ordinance for, is, is, is uh, referred to as an impact fee or a capital fee, which impacts the, the capacity that these the, the kids coming out of the house will take, the classroom space, the desks. So theoretically, our community has a certain number of desks that are you know, in classrooms that, are, that our current residents have paid for through their tax dollars and are paying through, for through bond payments. Um, the new houses will have access to that capacity. And um, you know, I, I think the discussion is around what, what, is, what, what, if any, fee should be charged to access the capacity the community has already paid for. Because we don't currently have a fee. So, um, you know, I'm a developer, I build a house, I sell a house. Part of the reason that I get you know, a decent price for that house is because it's in our district and we're entitled to send your kids to our school there. Um, now, the impact that has on our ability to house those students is not factored in to the developer hasn't written us a check for that. So it, it's, that's an ongoing question, but that's the second part of the fee. There is no ordinance for it currently. So we've asked them to take a look at that. Um, but a, a big reason why it's not in ordinance is we haven't built a large subdivision in Elmhurst for decades. Um, so, I mean, in the city's defense, it's not something that um, regularly comes before them. Um, but so we've asked our city, as long as they're proactively looking at updating things, to proactively look at updating the ordinances. So that was the update on that, and I'm open for questions. No, I just curiously say it's access to our capacity, um, and that the capital fee is described as that. That my impression is is there are operational impacts and there are capital impacts, and the second is really to deal with a capital impact created by the development of that subdivision rather than in a way a, a payment together those kids are going to come regardless it's the question is do we meet the impact um through both parts of a subdivision impact fee mm -hmm. i mean it, maybe it's just a different way of saying it but i think it's a way you look at it um there are some profitable development entities um that are are doing well in the development of this land and what we need to do is externalize as many costs as we or internalize I'm sorry as many costs of that development as possible 
Um, and I think it's a fair thing for the people of uh, District 205 to expect Elmhurst to do both um, in meeting those impacts because the impacts are both. They are both in terms of the number of people we have to have in our schools and in the number of classrooms. Um, this is going to be unique because it's all going to show up in one, well, at least the, our districts will likely show up mostly in one building, a building which is close to capacity already. And that's going to have impacts, both capital and operational. And so I just urge the city to please help us out in any way they can in meeting the needs of what will be an extremely significant change in that particular school community rising then through f from field through Sandburg and into York so and, and I think you said it better um, in, in my mind there's there's there whatever capacity is out there you, you could handle growth for a certain period of time for us absent develop absent this development this development may use that up quicker which may require us to redraw boundary lines or go to referendum to build new space sooner and, and so you know not to splash but um that i mean that's what i meant i mean it's a it's an opportunity cost of capacity that is out there now and whether that capacity gets filled sooner or later there is a cost to that capacity that is being that is benefiting the builder of the property so that's the discussion we're having on the capital side no i may not have said that the way you said it but no i think it's there's two ways to look at it. You could look at it as sooner. We're running out of our capacity sooner. Or you could look at it in terms of these are additional impacts that ordinary growth would not have imposed ever. Any, yeah. any uh, further questions, semantical discussions? Okay, then let's move on to policy committee. John. Well, I'm going to first apologize for leaving my file at home and try to muddle through with the uh, board notes on the, uh, on, on the uh, agenda here. Um, we had a meeting on, I'm sorry. We had a meeting on April 15th. We discussed the press update. Um, we uh, reviewed the following policies. Policy 2, column 3 school district elections. Um, that was uh, a statutory change to recognize that uh, election authorities or election responsibilities have been centralized to the county, uh, which I think is an improvement uh, for our staff. There was a policy 2 colon 110, board officer qualifications and duties. Again, it picks up more of the statutory change, uh, but we discovered an anomaly that, let me come back to this after I go through the list, uh, a correction that needs to be discussed. And I think it's better to discuss here than pulling it out of the consent agenda, but we will probably have to pull it out of the consent agenda anyway to, to correct it. Um, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, four colon three zero revenue and investments. Um, there was an accounting uh, change memorialized through legislation that had to be addressed. Um, five colon one zero uh, equal employment opportunity and minority recruitment, uh, recommending that that one be held. Um, because of the staff changes going on, we will need to name uh, the actual people who will be the new non-discrimination and complaint managers and insert their names into the policy manual for as long as they hold those jobs. So we're going to hold off on that one until that those names are known. Um, hiring process and criteria 530. Um, there is uh, a whole body of law developing regarding Facebook and passwords and what you can and can't do, and it is apparently been recognized as a privacy interest there, and the new statute, of course, addresses that, and we are uh, revising our policy to go along with that. Um, Fair Labor Standards Act 5, colon 3, 5, um, 
there was a language change regarding uh, overtime that needed to be addressed in connection with FLSA. Um, 5 colon 190, uh, some, again, more language changes regarding teacher qualifications. They look more stylistic than uh, substantive to uh, the committee. Uh, 5 colon 240 suspension. Um, the policy uh, had some questions that needed to be answered, and so it will be brought back later on. Um, 7 colon 140, again, the Facebook law. Um, uh, we have uh, agreed to uh, refer that to, or to, to the full board. 7 colon 180, uh, again, more language changes uh, regarding bullying um, to comply with statutes. Um, there was 7, point, 7 colon 70 attendance and truancy needed to uh, hold while uh, more administration uh, and staff comments were brought to bear on the revision of the policy. Same thing with 5 colon 125, personal technology and social media. I believe that the technology department needs to take a closer look at some of those changes. Um, you will see all those policies coming to the board uh, there may be some that are on the agenda tonight. I apologize again. I left my notes sitting on my desk at home. Um, policy, we had a, a good open discussion uh, again about policy 8 colon 25, advertising and distributing materials in schools provided by non-school related entities. Um, uh, there have been a number of inquiries as to whether we're properly looking at opportunity, or I'm sorry, adequately looking at opportunities to expand revenue through advertising and so forth. Uh, we had some very good discussions stretching a couple different meetings about what advertising is allowed, what should be allowed, who should advertise, what should they be allowed to advertise for. We compared to several benchmark districts several months ago. Uh, when it was brought back this time, uh, staff l took all our comments uh, and came back with uh, a, a rather favorable selection, Glenbard School District 87, uh, which seemed to align very nicely with what the committee believed. Um, I would say the most substantive issue um, that the committee had a recommendation on was simply that we um, promulgate standards and policy that would be applied to administration as opposed to some of the districts which required an advertisement by advertisement board approval. We didn't think that was a good idea given the uh, expected modest uh, revenues that would result from our very modest uh, forums presented to advertisers. Um, so we suggested changes to the District 87, um, District 87 uh, version, and I believe that is on our consent agenda for tonight, is it, Dave? Yes. yes. It's the last item, item M. Okay. So, and uh, all in all, a very, very efficient and brief meeting. Thank you, John. Any questions for <clears throat> the king of efficiency and brevity? Chris? Sorry, the, the, the item, um, board officer qualifications. Um, we have, in some instances, uh, a very uh, a custom job on our uh, policy manual. In other places, we follow the press updates rather religiously just uh, to have a system of, of uh, refining and following statutes and all that. We can follow along a lot easier. But in this case, um, several years ago, the policy was written to have one year term for our president, vice president, uh, and secretary. Um, and in changing what the press had from a two year, um, half the changes were made. So we have an inconsistency in the language. So we need to fix the language of that policy, um, pull it off the consent agenda. Uh, but it was recognized that we really need to visit the issue of whether we should have one or two uh, year terms for our officers. Um, we used the one year term um, at the beginning of our elected terms, 
Um, we got out of phase on a two-year term, and we just got back in phase tonight with the election of this slate of officers. Um, so it opens up the decision whether we want to continue the Elmhurst uh, intention to have one-year terms or to go with the press um, version for two-year terms. Um, the committee didn't have a recommendation either way. It seemed to be an issue that the full board should speak on. Um, and we will correct the policy to reflect the will of the board. Did I get that right? So when we get to the consent agenda, somebody wants to pull that item, right? You know, we could talk about it now and just pull it off because we do have to revise it. I don't think it's I think it still has the inconsistency in it. I guess I'd have to look. Or did we write it with one year or two year? Yeah. So is that something the board wants to discuss tonight? Think about, come back. We got enough to do. You want to, yeah. <laughs> you, you, yeah, you know, why, why don't we, why don't we pull it, and then defer it, and okay. discuss it at a future meeting. Yes, we have a whole year to get get we, to we, it. We do. So, all right. So, any any other questions for John? Then let me move to the uh, superintendent's consent agenda. I need a motion, and then I would like to pull item. I believe it's I. Well, first, first, uh, well, yeah, okay, yeah, you can, yeah. Yes, it's item I, I think. Okay. All right. However, so, we, okay, go ahead. All right, so then I would need a motion um, uh, on the rest of it without item I. Go ahead. Okay. I move that we approve the superintendent's consent agenda items A through H and J through M. Do I have a second? Second. <laughs> Thank you, John. All right. Moved by uh, Shannon, seconded by John. Uh, we're spending money on this consent agenda, so Mrs. Walsh, please. Mrs. Ebner? Yes. Mr. McDonough? Yes. Dr. Harrell? Yes. Mrs. Bastido? Yes. Mrs. Stufen? Yes. Mr. Bloom? Yes. Mr. Collins? Yes. That motion passes, uh, seven ayes, no nays. Um, and then regarding item I, um, I, go ahead, John. I'd like to make the amended motion that the Board of Education accept as a first reading the revisions to policy 2 colon 3 school district elections which will become effective at the time of its adoption and subsequently be added to the policy manual of the Board of Education, Section 2 Board of Education. That eliminates 2 colon 1 L. There are two policies in the, in the oh, okay. agenda item. Thank you very much. And the motion only includes the one that doesn't have a problem. Okay. Um, so moved by John, seconded by Emily. Um, to a, John, can you restate your motion just for clarity's sake? The Board of Education accept as a first reading the revisions to policy 2 colon 3 0 school district elections, which will become effective at the time of its adoption and subsequently be added to the policy manual of the Board of Education, Section 2 Board of Education. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion carries. Uh, next on our agenda is the superintendent's agenda. We have items A through F that I believe we need to take um, one at a time. First is the approval to uh, transfer money. This is uh, purely a procedural um, uh, to, to avoid a, a note in the audit, I guess. The approval of a resolution of the Board of Education transferring money from the Education and Operations and, and Maintenance Funds to the Debt Service Fund. Um, go, go ahead, so can I have a motion, please? I move that the Board of Education approve the resolution to transfer money from the Education and Operations and Maintenance Funds 
to the debt service fund for the purpose of payment of technology leases and debt certificates for uh, FY14. And a second. A second. Okay. Moved by Karen, seconded by, by Margaret. Uh, any discussion? Hearing none to transfer. Roll call vote. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Walsh. Mrs. Stupin? Yes. Dr. Harrell? Yes. Mrs. Bastido? Yes. Mr. Bloom? Yes. Mr. McDonough? Yes. Mrs. Ebner? Yes. Mr. Collins? Yes. That's seven ayes, no nays. That motion carries. Uh, next. Can I have a motion for item B, please? Karen, go ahead. I move that the Board of Education approve the resolution of appointment to DuPage Area Occupational Education System Board of Directors, which appoints Dr. Michelle Fitzgerald, Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum Instruction, to serve as its representative to the DuPage Area Occupational Education System Board of Directors for the 2014-2015 school year. And a second. Second. Moved by Karen, seconded by John. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion carries. Uh, item C. Karen, go right ahead. I move that the Board of Education adopt the instructional materials as recommended by the administration. I probably should move. I'll second. Okay. Moved by Karen, seconded by John. Uh, is there any discussion on this? Um, yeah, I just, I don't know if, do, if we want to discuss the feedback or was that just, um, how, but do you, you want to introduce the, the feedback? Yeah, there, there, was, there was one item that we had received some, some comments from, uh, from the members of the community about, uh, and in fact, we went so far as to ask uh, anyone interested to, to please read the book, let us know what they think. Um, and, um, you know, the, the, the responses were sent to the board. Uh, Mr. Pernot was kind enough to tally them for us and you want to just provide us with a quick summary. Yes, I believe, and the board has seen these, they all went directly to the board, but uh, it, it, the opinions seem to be almost evenly split. Um, the tallies were, I think, nine in um, favor and ten not in favor of the book uh, that was in question that you asked for feedback on. Uh, I'm not going to go through the comments. You have seen the comments, but I think there were pro and con on both sides. So really, bottom line is pretty evenly split on the opinion of whether to include uh, that text, uh, that book, into the language arts for freshmen uh, adoption. My, my suggestion on this, and, and Mr. Martin, the, the department chair of, of the high school, has is, is graciously been very patient and is in the audience. And Jake, we truly appreciate your being here because we'd like to, to include you in this discussion. Um, my suggestion, I mean, since the community is, seems to be evenly split on this, and the emails were evenly split, do you have a... Uh, I, do you have a broader gauge of how the community feels? No, no, I'm just saying I got a lot of comments face to face. I, I, I think what Dave was just saying was the emails that were sent to the Board of Education were evenly split. Yes. I just don't think that's the same thing as the community being evenly split. Okay, duly noted. Um, without disclosing your face to face comments, unless you'd like to. <laughs> okay. Here's my, here's my suggestion. Here's my suggestion. The, the, the people that were opposed uh, were very adamant in their opposition. Um, and I think the English department at York has some very good reasons to include that book um, in their curriculum. Here would be my suggestion. Um, that we ask the English department at York to, for, the, for the parents that, ob that object to it to have an alternate book at the ready. Um, for those for those students to read now now let me Mr. Martin if you don't mind me including you in the discussion do, do you think that's a, a reasonable thing to ask I would say yes and, uh, we'll, we'll yeah, 
Yeah, please, please come on up. Just for the, we haven't talked about the book itself, just so the public knows. It, the book is titled Absolute True Diary of a Part-Time Indian. It's being recommended, recommended for English 9. It's one of the first books students would read at York. Thank you, Dave. Mm -hmm. So uh, yes, thank you for, uh, for inviting me up. Um, I think that it's a perfectly reasonable uh, request. We would, do the, we would honor any request with, with any title. As, as you know, Jim, we would, we would any have title. Have first-hand experience, and, yeah, I, and exactly. I truly any, appreciate any, it. Any title that uh, you know, a student or a parent would um, have uh, an issue with or have an objection to, we have the approach that we would always want to make sure that we find the most appropriate title for them, the most appropriate text for them. We've, we've made the uh, changes in the past. We've made those accommodations, and we, we always would. In fact, because this book is being used as in place of a different one, we have that, that other text as, as a, a ready backup should any parent request. Yeah. What is the other text that you would recommend as, as the secondary backup? I would recommend uh, Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime because it's a title that we've used in the curriculum in the past. It's on the approved list. And I think that in terms of inquiry question, it fits pretty nicely in line with the same kind of question that um, students will be asking or, or addressing with, with part-time Indian. I think that in terms of engagement, it's proven to be less engaging for students than th what we've seen with, with part-time Indian. But again, if it was an issue of, um, of, of the material itself that, that a parent you know, uh, wanted to, to object to, we would happily make that switch, yeah. Can I get you, I'm sorry, to repeat the title of that book again? Uh, the alternate title? Yeah. It would be uh, The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. That'd be my suggestion for the alternate title. Thank you. I'm not a very quick writer. So, <laughs> so I, we have a little discussion around that. Um, is there, how does the board feel about that? Any questions for, for Jake um, about that? Um, is that something we want to take a look over and come back maybe the next meeting and, and, and approve that, you know, the, the Sherman Alexi uh, absolutely true diary of a part-time Indian with, with the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime uh, as the backup uh, alternate book, or do we feel comfortable maybe proceeding with that this evening? Sure, Shannon. Okay, yeah, sure. Shannon, go ahead. Um, how how does the backup work? I mean, wh how could a teacher simultaneous teach? simultaneously teach two books or, you know, how, how does that work and what, what's the notification of when you need to make a choice of which book you want to read? So we set out these guidelines um, for again for any course any text doesn't matter you know what what level or, or, or what, um, what what text it is um, that a student or parent would just notify the teacher you know, I see that this is a title you're using in you know, X course. I'd like to request an alternate title. And then that teacher will work with the student and the parent to find a more appropriate option. Um, I have a student right now who's reading an alternate title for the course that I teach. And what, the way that I approach it is the student is welcome to participate in any class activities that deal with the title we use as a course, as, as a class. Um, if the student elects not to, you know, the student can go to the Learning Commons, an alternate location, and work with their selected text independently. The teacher would lay out uh, a timeline for reading the text, um, you know, a, a reading calendar for that, and then the student and teacher would work independently in having like sort of like conversations about the book itself. The nice thing is all of our end of unit assessments, uh, say like a, a, a written essay, um, would be an answer to the inquiry question that applies to both texts. So whether I'm asking about the role of the individual in the community with part-time Indian, or whether I'm asking about the role of the individual in the community with uh, Curious Incident, a student can use either text to address the question. Um, and so while they miss, well, they have the option of participating in the whole class dialogue about the core text, um, they certainly are not um, required to be there. So it's sort of like their preference if they want to stay. I, I encourage them to at least stay to listen because the conversations about the inquiry can be stuff that's still applicable to their book. Um, but the teacher, and again, in my case, I just talk with the student individually about their reading of the book 
as especially as it applies to the, the, the sort of the central question for the, for the unit. Because it's really, it's really the inquiry base and it's that thought process and developing that skill, not necessarily the content. That's how it could parlay, correct? Exactly. That's why we want to make sure that it's applicable for, for any text that a student could still complete those end of unit assessments. And because the skills are applicable across text, the text just is like the lens through which we examine and practice the skill. Um, the, the option of, of choosing an alternate text certainly is, it exists without you know, massive curricular overhauls. Anything else, John? Well, we have you captured up there. Yeah. I wanted to ask you. Um, this book was is being uh, is proposed for adoption along with several others, mm -hmm. and it's part of a program for our ninth graders. Is that right? And I'm wondering if you could kind of discuss the 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 way that program develops, the place of the different books the particular role of this book in that program and, and what you're trying to accomplish and, and how this book would help you accomplish it. Speaking especially of the freshman curriculum, you mean? Yes. Yeah. Um, so we piloted this book a couple years ago with some of our freshman classes to get a sense of would this work with students, would this be a uh, text that would engage them, and uh, overwhelmingly uh, freshmen identified this as if you had to choose one text to keep this would be the text. You know, 70% of the kids polled um, said, yes, keep this book. We love this book. Uh, we love the narrator. We love the voice. We love the story. Um, and so we identified this book as the start, the, the introductory book that students would read um, at the start of their freshman year. So the first book to start the, the freshman curriculum um, because it asks the question, you know, how does, how does an individual fit into the community? Um, and it seems a very appropriate question to ask as you transition into freshman year coming from, you know, a much smaller likely middle school to the large community of York. Uh, you know, we, we experienced a lot of freshmen have that sense of being an outcast, much like the narrator of, of Part-Time Indian. Um, and so that book be becomes sort of the, the gateway into the other texts for the year. Um, we found, especially with our reluctant readers, that this was a book that really engaged them. Students who were historically so, so reluctant that they would, would intentionally leave their materials at home so as not to have to engage with them were bringing the book and not only bringing it every day but reading ahead. So as teacher would lay out a reading calendar, students would finish the book a week ahead of time, which is unheard of for a lot of our reluctant readers. Um, and so because of the engagement, suddenly they were that much more willing to, to grapple with the later texts. So when we then transition into Of Mice and Men, when we transition into uh, uh, Island of Dr. Moreau and then eventually in Romeo and Juliet, seem much more complex texts as the year continues. Students, because they've experienced success with this uh, introductory book, are able to, uh, first of all, apply the idea of that role of the individual to some more complex ideas, which the role of the individual is that narrative arc that sort of guides the whole year. Um, because they've experienced success and engagement with these titles, they're that much more willing to take those risks with some much more uh, complicated texts. Does that answer your question, John? Yeah. 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 I just wanted to comment. Um, the, the questions that we had actually produced really good insight as to how decisions get made. And I know that we've heard from the community and employees sometimes, what's the rationale? So um, if you want to add anything to this, I know that um, Dr. Johns had, had responded to my inquiry. Um, that our decisions aren't made just by student input or, you know, community input. It's a myriad of different data sets, you know, that there's um, decision criteria involves analysis of the material, community feedback, triangulation of other sources of feedback, the curriculum, the teachers, you know, professional, uh, you know, what we are paying them for in their, sure. their profession. Um, you know, alternative options, which of course we've already talked about and the merits of the materials and content and the knowledge of the community. And I also wanted to highlight, we talked about the Lexile scores, and I think that's important for us to understand because, um, you know, even at the elementary level, you know, students will be pulled um, for reading specialists, and, and, and a key component is, you know, as they progress through Lexile scores. 
And that's very important, and we need to encourage them to continue that. So by no means did we want to articulate that, you know, that we're changing it for this, you know, ninth grade um, English at all. So I think that that's really important for us to identify because we're talking about a lot of students, um, and we need to represent all of our students and make sure that we motivate and drive them appropriately. And it works. Um, so you very well articulated, um, Jake, thank you. It's a lot more than that, yeah. you know, but we do, you know, we really do, it, it is important to understand that we want to get people at the right grade level or Lexile scores too, um, as well as a lot of other pieces to it. It, it, I, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I, was say, I think you're, you're you're exactly right, and not to to paint the to too broad a brush that um, so students' choice is the only factor that we would consider. Uh, in fact, I think uh, Chris Covino might have shared with uh, a number of board members. We have a, a criteria, a list of criteria for determining the effectiveness of texts. Uh, student engagement is obviously one of them because we want to engage students, but we also consider things like rigor, like alignment to local and national standards, like alignment to uh, the, the, the inquiry questions of the curriculum. So there's uh, myriad factors, as you pointed out, Karen, that we would always consider. Um, also knowing that even one of them is, in and of itself, is not a sole determiner. Even something like Lexile can be a complicated uh, measurement because you see things like uh, Hemingway's The Sun Also Rises at a fourth grade Lexile score. You know, and you're thinking, wait a minute, how could I, you know, a, a, a Hemingway text be lower than, I think, I saw, I read an article recently, uh, Mr. Popper's Penguins is at a ninth grade Lexile, and so would actually be recommended for freshmen ahead of a Hemingway, or uh, Jane Eyre is, is at a, a, a middle school Lexile. And so, any one to factor is, is always going to be a little bit flawed in trying to use it as the single gauge. So we definitely want to include a variety of factors in making any recommendation. Um, you know that by the time the, a text hits the board, it's gone through an extensive review process on the part of the teachers as well, that we would never just sort of uh, haphazardly choose a text off the bookshelf and say, let's try this one. We would always want to be considering multiple options and a lot of the different criteria that we, we always use in evaluating the, the validity and appropriateness of a text to use in a course. So the only last comment that I had was a cautionary note, um, which is that we be very thoughtful uh, regarding the decision and rationale for seeking input um, for any text, not just this particular book and not others. Um, because I'm, I, I'm, I'm certain that um, the classic text would not be on the student's top priority <laughs> um, of, of interest at the reading interest um, if they were given a chance to comment. And, you know, we know as professionals and, you know, older, more experienced, right, mm -hmm. people, um, uh, that, that, you know, th they may not grasp the value of it at their particular age, but they will later on, and that's an element, so we need to be we need to be cautious about talking about, you know, student input and, and, and it's, that's complex too. Absolutely. That was one of the things we also, you know, discussed is that we wouldn't want to overhaul the freshman curriculum to the extent where we lose some of these, you know, classics, ones that, that um, almost add to uh, a student's literary background, that, that uh, you want to have some shared experiences that you could then bring to 10th, 11th, 12th, and really we're talking post-secondary levels um, where there are certain texts that students would almost uh, be assumed to have read at some point in their secondary schooling. And so that was another careful consideration we made and really why we chose to pair Partimenian with texts like uh, Of Mice and Men, uh, Island of Dr. Murrow and so on because students see, suddenly see a text that they were really drawn to has a lot of relationships with and connections to seemingly more uh, abstract or, or, you know, old texts um, that they're able to suddenly say, wait a minute, there is a, a, a quality of, of comparison for Lenny and George and their relationship in Of Mice and Men with, with Rowdy and Junior in, in Part Dominion. And suddenly they see that it's, it's not as old as they might initially like to think. And it's, so, it's a lot harder to, to dismiss a book like Of Mice and Men when you're able to draw relationships to a book like Part Time Indian that really engaged you. So thank you for great discussion. Yeah. Hey, Margaret? Um, one of the things I wanted to comment on this, you know, first off I want to thank everybody who, you know, all the community who read the book and, and sent comments on it. 
Um, but I, I think I, I love your suggestion on on having an option out and relying on our professionals um, to determine what the curriculum is. And I, and I, I equate that to, uh, or I make an analogy to, just like we would rely on our professionals for health care and or finance or financial uh, co consultation. These are educational professionals and we need to rely on their, um, on their choices, not saying that we don't ask questions, but we rely on their choices and if there's some time that there is some strong, um, if there's some strong feeling contrary to that, then as you would with any professional, you ask for an alternative. And I think that's what we're allowing. We're relying on our professionals. We're recognizing the knowledge that they have and recognize that it's not ever just one aspect or the other, that it, it's, it's multifunctional and they have considered all of these things that we're, we're talking about. Um, and then we still allow parent choice too. So I think this, this option that you propose is excellent. Thank you. Anything else? John? Just a real comment. I, I really like the compromise that you create in providing the alternative read. We try to often meet conflicting goals. Um, and in our tradition, I think literature is often about struggle. Um, and this book is certainly about struggle. Um, it's written in the voice of a 14-year-old. I think every parent should read it. Um, whether you like it or not, I think you should still read it. But I also note that what we're also tonight approving um, Sheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In, also about struggle. And I am Malala, which is about <laughs> an amazing struggle. So I just think this fits in that whole context and we can still uh, recognize that other people might not have the same viewpoint and rec meet the needs of different parents and empower their desires. Shannon? Yeah, I guess I, mean, I struggle with this one because you know, I think at the end of the day, uh, you absolutely want to respect a professional opinion, but the feedback that, uh, you know, plenty of feedback in favor of, the feedback I think we just have to acknowledge that that our, our schools and our community in our community are a partnership between the professionals and the parents mm -hmm. and when it comes to issues around values and beliefs that our parents are the ones charged with that by virtue of you know high school kids and I think that deserves equal amount of respect and consideration as we do this um, that said I think the solution you know makes a lot of sense but I just want to make sure that that because of someone's beliefs and values they don't end up they're not discouraged from selecting the alternative book because they feel like they're going to be left out, mm -hmm. ostracized, or you know, be the odd person that gets sent away. Yeah. And, and I would just love to be able to have some mechanism to come back and talk about this next year after we've done this with the alternative book, if this is the way we go, just to make sure that we're respecting everyone in the process. Um, so th that, that would be my comment. I would request that, that if, if we do approve it this way, that, that you're welcome to join us next year and talk to us about how it went. Yeah. So, thanks. I'll come back. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I I have some of the same feelings. I mean, this is really a controversial book, so I I think we need to be a little more upfront about the choices. I mean, a parent has to be really on top of the game of, okay, what title is my child going to be reading? I get, okay, what is that book about? But can we be more proactive saying, okay, here's a controversial book. If Here's another option. Here's the book. You know, can we be more upfront of, you know, we feel comfortable if you want to pick a different book? Because right now, what do we have? One kid, lone kid saying, oh, my mom wouldn't let me read this, and they're stuck in the library alone. You know, there's really not a good opt-out procedure. It's not a real upfront procedure. Mm -hmm. If we could get out in front and, and say, you know, and, and there's other titles, I'm sure, in the junior, you know, different years, and, and, and get out in front of it because there, there's a lot of opposition to the book, but, you know, I want people to have a choice. But the way we opt out now is, is not the best, best way 
because the parent has to be really ahead of the curriculum, which is so hard to do. That's a valid point, and one of the things we tried to uh, implement this year, this year's open house, in fact, was we put together a list of, you know, the, the syllabi always have a list of the text, but we also featured uh, a more comprehensive list that also, uh, in addition to listing the texts, featured uh, a brief summary of them that talked about, here's what the text is about, here's sort of its connection to the curriculum. Um, and again, I think that you're right that there's, uh, there's not yet a perfect system in place in terms of that, that communication piece, but um, trying to be as transparent as possible, to not, um, you know, hide anything whatsoever, but to be upfront and say these are the texts that we use, here's what they're about, here's their, their relationship to the questions and, and the, the focus of the units that we have, um, and really be, being open to, to conversation because, uh, again, that's, that's the approach that I try to take is, you know, we, we have a really sound rationale for why, but we're always open to, to feedback because that helps continue that conversation about, you know, what, are, what can we do to make sure that we have the most uh, effective and appropriate curriculum for the kids that we have. Um, so, yeah, I think that I welcome still feedback about how we can make that process more streamlined um, and invite that uh, more open conversation about the texts. Emily? Um, I was going to say, I think that the system, the way it was designed, is working because this is a proposal from the professionals. And like Margaret, um, I really do strongly um, feel, you know, that I trust because I don't know anything about the English curriculum. I do trust their opinions. But the system is designed where, as representatives of the community, we have to approve it. And so I think that that's what's happened here. I think the ninth grade English teachers felt very strongly about this book. and brought it to us and um, you know I had everyone I know read it I passed out copies I feel very comfortable um, you say it's very controversial I don't think it is very controversial I think we did get emails and maybe you know everybody talks to different people in the community runs into different people but um, I just didn't feel that it was even close to even um, just the people I asked and the groups I asked um, so I feel very comfortable approving this, but I'm glad that there has been a discussion about it. And I don't think that the alternative book is a, um, is a compromise it reached. I think that system has always been in place. It's always been available. So um, our teachers are aware that there's going to be parents that disagree, and they you know, have a system set up where the kids don't have to read the book. And so I think um, you know, I, some of the, the books I still remember reading in high school were the ones that were the hardest to read. Um, but they made an impression on me, and so I kind of, along with the community input and the input from the professionals, I bring my own personal um, opinion, and I'm very comfortable with this book. So. And just something to add real quickly, too, is that I, would, I do want to stress that none of these books are ever read in isolation, so that we say to a student, here's the book, I'll see you in three weeks, good luck with it. That the, the whole point of, of choosing the text, the text as a class text is because we want to engage in that conversation. Um, you know, John, to your point, great literature is about great drama, right, and, and conflict. That's what drives it. And so we want to make sure that students are able to approach these, these issues and these ideas as a group to really navigate through them together, uh, rather than saying, Good luck handling this and figuring out how to how to deal with this stuff on your own. Um, it, it really is. It, it, I would prefer to have a teacher who who is aware of the text and aware of the issues present, um, an adult leading students through that that discussion, that conversation about any text and any issues that they might encounter, um, because that's how we, we we accomplish our learning. Not just in the English department, but I think in life we accomplish our learning often as groups and not as as isolated units or individuals. So. I had a question for Dave, too. Um, there was a box that also solicited feedback on the material that was in the hallway, right? Did that have any? It was included in what we gave you. So what I gave you was emails and any paper oh, okay. that, and, and I think we, f we uh, copied those, and th those you have, too. So if you look at your, okay. uh, those are in there, too. Okay. Yeah. Any, anything else? Can I just, I, I I want to take the liberty to reiterate a couple of things I heard up here. One that, uh, to reiterate, this is a, a partnership between our professionals that we hire and our community. Mm -hmm. And the board is, uh, is charged with uh, reflecting our community's values within our curriculum. And uh, so this has been a great two-way information flow. Uh, so thank you. Absolutely. Um, you know, the other thing that, uh, that that Jake, if I can charge, if I can challenge you to leave a legacy. Sure. 
and, and that is to to let parents know that that there are options. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, d during the course of, of this particular book and talking to people in the community, I, I found some, very, some parents that were very involved in, uh, in, in high school, in York High School, um, and I told them about my child's personal experience with uh, not being very comfortable with one of the books she was asked to read and, and the graciousness in w with which I was treated and the alternative that was uh, proposed, readily accepted, um, and they looked at me like they never thought of that. Hmm. And, and so I, I think the word just isn't out there. Sure. That, that if your kid really has trouble or if the parents, or, or if the reading selection really goes against a parent's value, that, that, that it just takes a quick email and, and a quick discussion and phone call to, to have an alternative proposed. Sure. Um, I just found it interesting that that was news to some very involved um, very well respected people within our community yeah. and so That's so if point. you can get that Thank word you. out I, that. I appreciate it yeah thank you very much of course anything else for mr marty we let him go home at 10 o'clock <laughs> jake thanks very much thanks a lot thanks for the opportunity to speak i appreciate it uh before jake leaves too i just because not everybody's seen to know but jake is leaving <laughs> us uh jake is moving to minneapolis yeah uh i want to thank jake for staying here this evening through all this and his dedication and being the chair of the English department at York. Not an easy job uh, on a number of levels, but Jake has done a great job. So I appreciate your leadership, Jake, and you, all the best in Minneapolis. Fun, Thank you. It's been, fun it's, been, it's been my honor to be part of the York community. It's been wonderful. And I have truly treasured the eight years that I've been here and I'm going to miss it. I miss it a lot. So thank you. Appreciate it. And Jake, we're going to miss you. <laughs> so. Thank you. Um, so, there's, is that the conclusion of our discussion? Shall we vote on uh, item C, approval of instructional materials for new and modified courses with the addition of the, um, the alternative book, The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime, as an alternative to the, it's already an approved book, yes. John, One question, on. Dave, was there any feedback about any of the other materials? Or it's in that collection that you, that I just discovered. No, no. <laughs> no. I, I, I held my tongue on the Paul Krugman <laughs> economics book. I want you to know it took every ounce of energy that I had. That's why they threw this one in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, it was a distra an intended distraction, but um, it, it is aligned with the AP test, and Krugman uh, is pretty tame throughout it. So, even if okay. it's not real economics. Um, so, back to item C. We're getting a little too happy at 10:10 at night. Um, so, approval of instructional materials for new and modified courses. We have a motion on the floor. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, that motion carries. Um, next, item D. Let's just keep going. I move that the Board of Education accept the donation of an ex experimental alternative energy vehicle with an approximate value of $5,500. This donation is accepted in accordance with policy 8, colon 80, gifts to the district. Uh, second? I second with gratitude to the COPEX. Thank you. Move, move by Karen, seconded by John, and let me just reiterate uh, thank you uh, to the COPEX, the parents of uh, York student, for uh, donating this vehicle for instructional use in our uh, industrial tech department. Uh, all, any, other, for any further discussion? Okay. Um, this involves money, I guess, so Mrs. Walsh. Mrs. Stufen? Yes. Mr. McDonough? Aye. Mr. Bloom? Yes. Dr. Harrell? Yes. Mrs. Ebner? Yes. Mrs. Bastido? Yes. Mr. Collins? Yes. That's seven yeses, no noes. That motion passes. Um, the next is item E. I move that the Board of Education accept the donation of two basketball poles and adjustable backboards and new water fountains and water bottle filling stations from the Jackson School PTA 
in an amount not to exceed $10,000. This donation is accepted in accordance with policy 880, 8,80, gifts to the district. Moved by Karen, seconded by oh, Shannon beats Margaret to the buzzer. Seconded by Shannon. Any discussion? I think, yes, thank you to the Jackson PTA. We, we separate these out because um, through people's generous donations of their time and money, we just want to call it out to, to say thank you. Um, any other discussion? Uh, hearing none, Mrs. Walsh. Mrs. Stupin? Yes. Mrs. Ebner? Yes. Dr. Harrell? Yes. Mr. McDonough? Yes. Mrs. Bistito? Yes. Mr. Bloom? Aye. Mr. Collins? Yes, that's seven yeses, no noes. That motion carries. Uh, item F, please. I move that the Board of Education approve the donation to Jefferson Elementary School in the amount of $600. I second Thank with you. gratitude to Ms. Carlton and the others who uh, made this donation. All right. Um, move, moved by uh, Karen, seconded by John. Any discussion? You can just uh, reiterate our thanks to uh, Kimberly Carlton for this uh, very generous gift and the uh, match by her employer. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Mrs. Walsh? Mrs. Stufen? Yes. Mr. McDonough? Yes. Mrs. Ebner? Yes. Mrs. Vistito? Yes. Mr. Bloom? Yes. Dr. Harrell? Yes. Mr. Collins? Yes. That's seven yeses, no noes. That motion carries. Next on our agenda is upcoming meetings. Tuesday, April 29th, and I will add that all of these uh, take place in the room that we're in currently. Um, Tuesday, April 29th, as a special Board of Education meeting, um, with one exception, it is in room 112 of this building. Uh, and that is a uh, closed session meeting, by the way. Um, Monday, May 5th, is a committee of the whole board improvement meeting at 4.30 p.m. in the, di in, uh, the District 205 Center. Um, Wednesday, May 7th, is the regularly scheduled curriculum and instruction committee meeting at 7 p.m. Tuesday, May 13th, is our regularly scheduled board of education meeting at 7.30 p.m. Wednesday, May 14th, is a another special board of education meeting, which is a closed session, uh, again, in room 112 of this building. Uh, and then Tuesday, May 20, 20th, is the Finance and Operations Committee meeting at 6.30 p.m. And then Tuesday, May 27th, uh, is our regularly scheduled Board of Education meeting at 7.30 p.m. Uh, and that brings us to action on closed session items. Uh, item A, please. I move that the Board of Education approve the administrative recommendation for the expulsion of York High School student G., for the remainder of the 2013-14 school year and the entire 2014-15 school year. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Thank you. Uh, moved by Emily, seconded by John. Any discussion? Uh, hearing none. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Uh, opposed? Uh, that motion carries. Uh, item B, action authorizing the administration to notify teachers of groupings. Uh, can I have a motion, please? I move that the Board of Education authorize the administration to notify teachers of proper groupings based on an amendment to Section 24-12 of the Illinois School Code. And a second, please. Okay. I Moved by John, seconded by Shannon. Um, any discussion? Let me ask Mr. Pernod for just a quick general explanation. Yeah, and I'm going to turn this over to Brad. He can explain. 
why this motion is here. At a previous meeting, the board was asked to do something very similar. Uh, at that meeting, the board did put teachers into groupings and approve that list. However, there was a change that was brought to our attention that needed to take place to put teachers who were part-time or filling a leave of absence into a group, different grouping based on a change in a in a recent change in state law, and that is what you're being asked to do this evening. You will be putting part-time teachers and teachers who are filling a leave of absence into group one, which is accordance with state law. Thank you, Brad. Uh, any discussion? Okay. Oh, you have something, Jen? Oh, okay. Um, then, yeah, I, I hear you. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries as well. Next on the agenda is board communications. Uh, are there, is there any? Karen? I know that several meetings ago we had talked about the testing uh, with park coming up and um, you know it was going to be a springtime of filled with testing and we had a lot of concern. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that LEND, which is our legislative education um, network of DuPage County, is having a uh, dinner dialogue um, and it's titled What You Need to Know About Park, ACT and More. It's hosted by LEND and IHSDO and there'll be three superintendents of which, um, Dave, we are part of that 30-member group, if I recall the number. There were three superintendents that recently um, spoke at the Capitol in, at a legislative session um, to highlight our concerns. They will be at this panel as well as Advance Illinois. So that's April 30th, um, 6 to 8.30 p.m. at Lake Park School District 108. Anything else? Having reached the end of our agenda with nothing else on it, declare this meeting adjourned.